Thomas Paine, Thomas Paine, Thomas Paine, Sam Adams, Sam Adams, Sam Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, Benjamin Franklin. These men spoke up for what they thought was right. From their courage came such documents as the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. The United States. From their willingness to speak what was sometimes unpopular but right, we enjoy such liberties as freedom of speech, the right to keep and bear arms, and freedom of religion. There are those who still wish to oppress our freedoms, and there are still patriots willing to stand up and defend life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Men like Zeb Bell, who honor our founding fathers and what they stood for. It's now time for Zeb at the ranch, speaking up and defending your freedoms. Brought to you by Magic Valley Les Schwab Tire Centers and all of the other great advertisers on the program. And now, Zeb Bell. Calvin Coolidge said these words, and I think they're very appropriate on this Veterans Day. Because of what America is and what America has done, a firmer courage, a higher hope, inspires the heart of all humanity. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Here's Kate Smith. And God bless America. Followed by a patriot with our Pledge of Allegiance on Veterans Day. Good morning. my home sweet home how true thank you very much kate smith and god bless america and god bless all of you this morning i'm zeb bell at zeb at the ranch with our major sponsor your magic valley les schwab tire centers all seven locations serving you really really nice people and of course some of our great advertisers include lease furniture floors and more at 459 overland and burley and our friends at western way services always at your disposal get on the route service today call kelly and the crew at 734-6969. And a very good morning on this Veterans Day 2014 to the lovely Gina Jameson. Well, good morning, sunshine, and it's going to be a beautiful day. You know, um, I've been looking forward to this morning's program. Uh, for the first hour, actually hour and a half, up until about 9.30, we're going to concentrate basically on Veterans Day. And uh, if anybody has any thoughts or reminiscent uh, uh, memories of Veterans Days and veterans, uh, feel free to call this first hour and we'll put those on the air. How's that? That sounds perfect. And do we have a pledger? We have Rotten on for the pledge and Mr. Michael Rogers on for the weather. Thank you, Gina. I appreciate everything you do. Uh, Rotten, if you would please, our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Sir, I thank you for calling in and giving our pledge on Veterans Day. Thank you so much. You're more than welcome. God bless you, Every my friend. veteran out there, have a good day. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Dal, we appreciate you. God bless. Uh, right now, we're going to go to the weather forecast. And the weather brought to you by our dear friend, Michael Rogers. And it's brought to you by Cheney Flooring and Home Design, 1228 Oakley Avenue in Burley. Look for the blue door. I had a chance to meet Kyle the other day. As a matter of fact, we were down there. Kyle and Whitney have really built a great business with carpet and flooring, kitchen construction, all the home decor, and all the decorations for your home. And please stop in and see them today. They're, they've been just really absolutely uh, giving customers home design products that are aisles apart, not miles apart. Please stop in and see them today. Cheney Flooring and Home Design, 1228 Oakley Avenue in Burley, 6786945. Once again, look for their blue door. Michael Rogers Weather, good morning. It is 15 degrees in beautiful downtown Merton. Look for a high today of 35. 15 will be the overnight low. Snow on Thursday. Rain on Friday. Rain and snow on Saturday. There you have it. Enjoy the weather. Still, what do you got? Michael, are you still there? 
Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay, listen, I saw a picture, and I thought of you early this morning at about 4 o'clock. I saw a picture that was taken by the National Weather Service, and if you get a chance, you might want to go to the computer and try to find it. It showed the cold front, literally, with the clouds and everything, coming down into the United States, where it dropped 50 degrees in less than 24 hours. If you get a chance to look at that picture, do so. It's an amazing photo. Sir, I already saw that picture. I posted it up on my website and on my timeline on Facebook. But thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right, buddy. Hey, thanks. Best weatherman anywhere. Michael, thank you very much. Brought to you by Cheney Flooring and Home Design, 1228 Oakley Avenue in Burley. Look for the blue door. Or give them a call, 678-6945. You realize that uh, a lot of the cattle coming off the hill and cowboys and cattlemen, they're going to Burley Livestock Sale Yard. Absolutely. Absolutely. Merv May and Kay Draghi and uh, Lance Udy. Man, oh man, those folks will take care of you. I guarantee you. And all you have to do is just give them a call and find out more about what's going on at the Burley Livestock Sale Yard. 678-9411. 678-9411. Sale every Thursday. Ripping good sales. And let me tell you, they, they know how to treat you right at Burley Livestock Auction Yard. You better believe it. 1100 Occidental Avenue in Burley. And the sale time Thursday, 10 o'clock. Get your consignments called in right now to, for the big sale on Thursday. Day. Good morning, caller. You're on the air. Good morning, Jeb. Yes, sir. Well, when I stuck my flag out this morning, along with my Air Force flag, it all come flowing back from what's happened since 1941. And I'm telling you, Jeb, uh, it, it's heartbreaking to see what has gone on since 1941. You know, Al, uh, you have lived uh, the life of a serviceman, as many, many of my friends here in this area, and you've uh, been there and done that in simplistic language. But uh, looking back on Veterans Day and knowing my father served in World War II in Germany and my uncle served in World War II, my other uncle served on the, uh, on the Japanese front, and all the memories and uh, my buddies, my dear friends that served in Vietnam, many of which that didn't come back, uh, it's a day of remembrance and it's a day for people to look at that flag and I say th simply just think to themselves, thank you. Yes, well, um, it's to them idiots that don't know what it is to be a veteran or American, uh, I say if you don't like this country, you start stomping on the flag just gather up your bags, and I'll help put the first dollar towards your ticket out of the United States. I will match the funds, my friend. Thank okay, you. Have a good one. God bless you, sir. Thank Bye. you. Don't forget our friends at Daryl's Cleaners. Restore items. Yeah, you know, don't let somebody come up to you and say, oh, just throw that away. It's no good. Go ahead and throw it away. No, no, wait a minute. Take it into Kevin at Daryl's Cleaners and let him take a look at it and make sure that uh, maybe he can restore it. He's excellent at that. Please, uh, for all your cleaning needs, it's Daryl's Cleaners, 1223 Albion Avenue in Burley. I take all my clothes in there, my Wranglers and my sports shirts, sports jackets, everything. They do a phenomenal job. They will for you, too, at Daryl's Cleaners, 1223 Albion Avenue in Burley. Caller, I'll be right with you. Stand by. Please have patience. I ask that of all the folks. And I also want to remind everybody about uh, SafeLink Internet. Hey, Say no to the winter blues with high-speed internet and get the first month free, plus free installation. Are you kidding me? Yes, at SafeLink Internet Services, Idaho's number one choice for wireless internet, 17 years and growing. You better believe it. Call them at 677-8000, 677-8000, SafeLink Internet, serving you. Caller, good morning. You're on the air. Good morning, Jeff. <clears throat> Uh, I just like to thank the veterans. They, all of them. Some gave all, but they all gave a little bit of something. And as far as all, all the veterans I know, they'd still give it all up one one more time. That's what it takes. Amen. Amen. Very well stated, Riley, and I appreciate your call very, very much. Thank you. You have a good day. Thank you, sir. You know, I would imagine. And uh, this is not meant to be uh, at all uh, humorous 
or meant to be taken in that vein. But I would imagine many, many vets today probably will walk upstairs into the attic or probably will go over to the closet and they'll peel back the hangers in the closet, go through all the jackets, go through all the vests and all the winter coats. Ah, there, in the back of that closet hangs their old uniform. Now, it may not fit them today, but there was a day that they stood straight and oh so proud in their service to America. The Army, the Air Force, the Navy, the Marines, Coast Guard, National Guard, God bless each and every one of you. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I am extremely sincere when I say a person that has been so blessed, such as me, by living in this great land of opportunity, the United States, because of what you have given. And to each and every veteran out there, and God knows I have so many dear friends that are veterans, thank you. Thank you so much. Calls are welcome, 436-2244-1866-927-4587. Give me a call if you would, please. Valleywide Home and Ranch, uh, going to be meeting with those folks a little bit later this afternoon, as a matter of fact. And uh, they're located at 910 South Oneida in Rupert. Oh, my goodness sakes, get ready for winter. You heard the forecast. Cold. <laughs> Cold, that sums it up. And uh, they've got all your propane heaters and propane and heat tape and they got all your winter clothing and your winter gloves boy that's something I gotta have is winter gloves my hands have been so smashed up and broken up I just absolutely I'm trying to still find the warm gloves of my life anyway they're over there I'm sure winter gloves at Valley Wide Home and Ranch and Ariad Boots they've got it all for you all your winter clothing is right there at Valley Wide Home and Ranch along with your feed needs all your livestock equipment handling needs everything at Valley Wide Home and Ranch, 910 South Oneida in Rupert. Don't you wait a minute. No, no, no. You get over there right now today and visit with the good folks at Valley Wide Home and Ranch. Calls are welcome and appreciated on this Veterans Day 2014. I'd like to hear your thoughts about Veterans Day. And uh, while I'm waiting for your call that I know is coming in, I also want to acknowledge our friends at Ramsey Heating and Electric at 2600 Overland Avenue in Burley. The number to call is 678-0459. You know, tomorrow morning you might just take your little toesies and scamper across the linoleum floor and go to yourself, holy buckets, I forgot to have my furnace serviced. Don't let that happen. Please call them right now today, 678-0459. Get your furnace ready for cold weather. And also check out the really the quality, the best in air filters for your furnace so that that furnace can run efficiently. You better believe it. Ramsey Heating and Electric in Burley where they provide warm winters and cool summers. Good morning, caller. You're on the air. Well, good morning, Mr. Bell. Hello, Donna. How are you doing? Today is a very, very kind of a melancholy day. Um, and I'm going to be very honest with people about my feelings uh, about Veterans Day. I got up this morning and I turned on the news and one of the very first stories was uh, naturally about Veterans Day and service and it happened to be a story about those that didn't come home. And I lost so many dear friends overseas in Vietnam that uh, not only were high school buddies but also college buddies. And today is a day that um, it means a lot. You betcha. You know, not just today, but especially today, yeah. um, in, in today's world, we need to be able to, to thank and appreciate all that the past, present, and future service members are going to do for our freedoms. Um, I just want to take a second and tell everybody, you know, all the veterans, I come from a veteran family, a military family, 
Um, we so appreciate everything y'all do. And even the heroes here at home. Absolutely. Um, you don't have to be in the military to be a hero. But today is especially for our veterans. And we love them all and we appreciate them. And we want to say thank you. Donna, that was uh, that was as well said as I've ever heard any little uh, speech about Veterans Day. And I just want to say kudos for what you just did. Thank you. Well, thank you. And, and you know what, Seb, thank you for all you do, too. Well, uh, my part is minuscule compared to what uh, our veterans have done for our country. And I, I just I can't understand, Donna, why we as a nation let them fall through the cracks when they return from service. I just get it makes me mad. That's the easiest way to say it. Well, it makes us angry, too. Um, you know, we all need to step up and give these boys and girls, uh, men and women, what they deserve. Amen. They signed a blank check when they joined the military. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Donna. You bet you, my friend. God bless. Thank you. Yeah, for the veterans today, I'd like to hear from you. I really would. I uh, Whatever branch of the service you were in and what your duty was, I would like to know. And uh, give me a call, 436-2244-1866-927-4587. Well, I'm waiting for this next call. Standby caller. I'll be right there. Don't forget Denny's Restaurant. Now, I have been, like I said, blessed. I have absolutely no complaints. We have a business to where we uh, have, uh, basically, we own this program. We go out and sell our own ads and have our own sponsors and advertisers. And we're blessed when we have people like like uh, our great friends at Denny's Restaurant. What a staff, what a management, and what a great menu. At Denny's Restaurant, 611 Overland in Burley. Thomas and Terry, the whole crew, they have been outstanding in serving us with Zeb's Lunch Bunch when we go over there. And you'll have the same great service, and especially the same great food, whether it's for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. You stop in and enjoy. Enjoy Denny's Restaurant, 611 Overland in Burley, the home of Zeb's Lunch Bunch. Good morning, caller. You're on the air. Yes, I would like to salute the veterans. Uh, my brother Jesse and my other brother Primo for being up there in 1965. And uh, I salute them, brothers of mine. God bless you. You know, sir, you said 1965, and that's the Vietnam era. And uh, yes, my, my brother was one. My, my brother was drafted in April, and the other one was drafted in October. I see. Uh, that same year. I see. And they're a year apart. <laughs> Well, I just want to say to your family, thank you for the service, and God bless you for your call this morning. Thank you so much. God bless you, sir. Bye thank bye. you. Thank you. What a nice man. He calls in on occasion, and it just he's just a very, very nice man. Good morning, caller. You're on the air. Good morning, Chad. I'm going to get emotional. <laughs> anyway, um... I want to thank my grandfather, my great uncle, my um, my dad, my father-in-law, my husband, and his two uncles that served in World War II, and my husband and my brother were both during Vietnam, and then my son and his wife were during Iraq, and then my father-in-law has eight members of her family that have been in the military, and then my niece, and then my dad had seven brothers also in the military. Oh, my. So I thank them. Well, would you please, I hope they're able to listen to this show this morning. I hope many of them heard your remarks, but from my and house... I'm going to face now. My dad is 90, and he's still with us, and oh. his brother... Is 89, and he lives in Pocatello, and he's still with us. Wow. But, um, and of course, my father-in-law passed away, but Dennis is still here, and uh, my son and daughter-in-law, and most of her family, and I just started counting up. I thought, wow, what a background. 
Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And by the way, I just want to say to you, you did an excellent job in saluting your family and the military this morning. Thank you for your call. God bless you. Thank you. You're Thank very you. welcome. Thank you. Caller, good morning. You're on the air. Good morning, Mr. Bell. Yes, sir. With a saddened heart, I'm not going to be able to be with you this year on your program. This is the first time in several years, but I had to call in and uh, let you know that uh, that uh, we're thinking of you and what you do for our veterans. Uh, you keep it out front, and without you, uh, our fight would be a lot harder. You know, I want to thank all. George, you, this is George Mass on the phone, and he's one of my dearest, dearest friends. Uh, Donna called a little bit ago, and George has been so helpful. I mean, I just, I get all teared up and a little emotional myself when I think of all the things that George is involved in, all the things he's done, POW, MIAs, all the things he's done for our military and remembrance. George, you're a special man, and today, like you said a moment ago, it's the first day in years that our paths won't cross because you had previous commitments, etc. But please know that I appreciate everything you've done for me. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Zabby. You know, uh, to all the veterans out there, uh, those that aren't homebound, let's get out and go to the schools, uh, hospitals. There's so many uh, programs going on to honor us today. Absolutely. And, uh, those kids, my grandson was here all weekend, and he sang to me all weekend on what he's going to sing to me today. Oh, my. It's very, very heartwarming. George, uh, I mean this. God bless you and your family. Thank you for all that you do in the community. I really mean it. And have a wonderful day, my friend, please. You too, Zeb. And uh, thank you for what you do for us. It's, uh, you make our job a lot easier. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You know, thank you, uh, thank you George, and uh, I just want to add something to it. Caller, stand by just a minute. I was not able to serve in the military. I was 4F, and I've always felt like I owed a lot to this country. And uh, this is hard for me to say, but uh, with friends like George and many others that have put their lives on the line, and my buddies from high school and college that didn't come home, thank you again. Thank you. Caller, good morning. You're on the air. Good morning, Zeb. I would like to thank all the families of the veterans who did not come home. It's such a tragedy to have someone removed from your family. And unfortunately... In my family, we did not have that. But I, I am a veteran myself. I served from 1955 to 1958 in the United States Navy. I was stationed on an aircraft carrier. And we steamed off of the coast of Indonesia for 60 days in 1958. Mm -hmm. For those who don't know, the Indonesia later become Vietnam, North and South. Right. And we did not know anything about that until we came back to the States and about six months later that this was the Indonesia crisis. Right. And you never know when you're going to be in harm's way when you join the military. Absolutely. Uh, Start being at sea for 60 days. <laughs> yeah, really. I, I couldn't do that at all. Uh, boy, me and the, being on the ocean, that'd be a long, long time, possibly unbearable. Keith, uh, to you, your family, and for your service to this great country, God bless you. And thank you for being such a great listener and sharing with us. I got a hard break right now. I got to get it in, but thank you for your call very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, sir. I know there's another call waiting, and please, I'll get right to you, so please do not hang up. I want to get your call on. I want to remind everybody that right now the Capital Press Ag Minute is brought to you by Pacific Steel and Recycling, 320 West Main in Burley. These are really wonderful folks, and they say bring any of the following in, like new or gently used coats, clothes, blankets, or toys for children ages 1 to 5, and you'll get $10 more per ton for scrap iron. 
iron and a five cent bonus on aluminum. Hey, stop in. These people are really community oriented at Pacific Steel and Recycling. Right now, the Capital Press Ag Minute. Today's Ag Minute brought to you by the Capital Press, the West Ag Weekly. If the escalating dispute between longshoremen and container terminal operators leads to a shutdown of West Coast ports, the president has the power to temporarily reopen them. The Taft-Hartley Act of 1947 gives the president emergency authority to order union workers and employers back to work for 80 days. Under the statute, workers can also be prohibited from staging a slowdown, which is effectively a disguised work stoppage, says Michael Leroy, a labor law professor at the University of Illinois. Before the president could impose such an order, he would have to appoint a board of inquiry to find that a national emergency is imminent. He would then ask a federal judge for an injunction. For the Capitol Press Ag Minute, this is Brandon Tenner. For more agriculture news and information, turn to the West's Ag Weekly, the Capital Press, and CapitalPress.com. Brought to you by Pacific Steel and Recycling. Wonderful people to work with at 320 West Main in Burley, 678-2321. Caller, good morning. You are on the air. Good morning, Zeb. This is Jerry. Hey, how are you doing this fine morning? I am great, sir. Thank you for your call. Okay, yeah, yeah. I, thank you so much for uh, um, the veterans' uh, support that you give and uh, on your program and and uh, all of your callers. So uh, this is a uh, great day in America. So anyway, what I was calling about a little bit was uh, I uh, I was in the Army Reserve from 1969 to 1976 and. Uh, that's uh, that's a group of, of people that are probably uh, and maybe maybe there's a reason for it, but probably one of the most unrecognized groups in mm-hmm. the, in in the country. Mm-hmm. Uh, even though we are we consider ourselves veterans, we when not, most of us never went over over to Vietnam because we were in country most of the time, and uh, and we uh, we served voluntarily and and uh, anyway, uh, I think that. Uh, uh, if there's if there's any one thing that uh, is, is probably uh, um, what do I want to say probably bothers me more than anything else is that's the one group of guys probably from about 1964 till about 19 got to be till about 1980 somewhere in there that uh, they have zero benefits those guys oh they serve for six years uh, some of them more. Uh, at, at, uh, a lot of the guys I, far, I, I served with were farmers. Uh, in a minute's notice, they were ready to, to, to haul out and go wherever Uncle Sam told them to go uh, for six years, and never knowing whether you were or not. And, uh, and they have, uh, they're probably the most unrecognized group, and they have, they have zero benefits oh my goodness. Uh, in the Veterans uh, Administration. Well, um, there, uh, <clears throat> during that time period, so it's it's really interesting. But the other thing I was going to say is, um, the older I get, the more I, I admire all those people that I served with uh, here in the state of Idaho um, in the Army Reserve. I mean, I, um, the guys I I served with, they were just I want to say uh, they had your back. They would be there at a moment's notice. I mean, it's just amazing when you're in the military and when you're in a unit. Um, um, what goes with that. Absolutely. Jerry, that was very well said and stated, and thank you so much for bringing that point of attention to us, and I appreciate it. All right, Zeb, you have a great day, and uh, and God bless all the people out there that, that served. And uh, by the way, my dad served in uh, in uh, Japan, or not in Japan, in the Philippines during World War II, so in the, in the Japanese theater, so... Uh, um, over there for 13 months, uh, uh, so uh, which was a tough goal for those guys. Absolutely. Jerry, anyway, have a great day. God bless you, my friend. Thank you so much. Okay. I appreciate that. You know, the treatment of our veterans and the treatment that uh, they're not getting is absolutely appalling to me. When I hear, and, and there was another story this morning in the news about uh, the VA scandals and the lack of being able to get in and see doctors and the lack of this or the lack of that or maybe the corruption here. Why? Why are we putting up with this? 
You know, uh, we have sports stars, and I'm a sports nut, as you know. But when we have a sports star that decides to leave one team on free agency and go elsewhere, the sky is the limit as to what a proposed team that wants him will pay for that athlete's services. Millions and millions and millions of dollars. Doesn't make any difference how much. We're going to go get him. We're going to pay for him. But our veterans come home and they need help. Whether it's through the injuries that are apparent or whether it's PTSD, whatever it might be. And there seems to be a complete foot dragging on behalf of our government and, quite frankly, our society to take care of these soldiers. I go back to Sergeant Tamarisi that made a wrong left turn and ended up in Mexico and then also in jail for over 200 days. And I sit here... And, and don't you dare, don't anybody in the audience criticize me for this. I am criticizing the president. I am criticizing the politics. I am criticizing the State Department. I am criticizing everybody in our government for not getting him out. I've talked to people back on the East Coast. And, you know, you get the liberal persuasion, well, the president is so busy with other things, he couldn't do this, and, well, they had to be diplomatic about it. And John Kerry, there were things that had to be addressed with the president Nieto of Mexico. Don't go there. This young man is out because his mother's perseverance and others outside of the government, Montel Williams, others. But it was a critical shame that he was left in prison in the first place. We let daily people across our porous borders to do what they wish. They may be members of a drug cartel. They may be members of gangs. They may be members of terrorist groups. We don't know because we have a very open porous border. Come on! Yeah, well, you can go to Boston, you can go to Boise, you can go to Sacramento, you can go wherever. But one of our soldiers makes a wrong turn and acknowledges that he made a mistake, called 911, did everything he could to rectify the problem. The Mexican government throws him in prison. And our government doesn't do diddly squat to get him out. They're not doing anything to get out Pastor Abedini from Iran. I'd negotiate with Iran. You bet I would. I'd call the Ayatollah and say, hey, I let him out now. Caller, good morning. You're on the air. Good morning, Zeb. It's just me again. You know, I want to just make a comment on what you just brought up. You know, Sergeant Tamarisi served two tours honorably made a wrong turn where was the um, uh, press conference when he got home from the White House um, it, yet he did so much for the uh, Bergdahl release <clears throat> um, they did a family uh, press conference um, it just irritates me I have my own opinions about the Bergdahls but where, where was the recognition and the thank you for that young man who spent over 20 or 200 and some days being tortured in Mexico? Yeah, All where, where was the was transfer? Phone call. Where was the transfer, Donna? Where was the transfer of maybe five illegal aliens? He could have gathered up five illegal aliens and he could have called President Nieto and said, uh, we're sending back five illegal aliens and we want our soldier back. You know, this is so ludicrous, the way this happened and the way this went down. And people within the Obama administration that I have talked to, they are complete baboons when it comes to any common sense. Uh, well, the president's busy and he's got a lot on his plate and he's got this to do here and that's, uh, that's a task for those that are underneath him in this other office and John Kerry has been... They had a multitude of excuses. Donna, you know as well as I do that a president... I, I, I will say this, and I don't know this could happen, but I would estimate it would happen. Had Ronald Reagan been in office, 
he would have called President Nieto and said, Hello, Prez, it's 3.15 in the afternoon. You've got 10 minutes to let him go. You betcha. But that was a different era, Zeb. The one we have now, the government does not respect our military uh, people, especially, especially the men that hold the highest office. Very well stated. Donna, again, I thank you for your call. You betcha. You thank you day. very, very much. Barry Equipment and Rental, and you know I'm always talking to you about Barry Equipment and Rental. Three locations, Twin Falls, Jerome, and Burley. Uh, listen, I'm telling you, they've got all the equipment you need. Uh, buy a new uh, Coyote or Bobcat. I bit my tongue. <laughs> Sorry about that. A new Coyote or a Bobcat or a Deuce on Loader, and uh, I'll tell you what, you can really get some great financing and low, low prices right now, so check it out. Go visit with the folks that really know it, Barry Equipment and Rental, and that's of course, uh, Eli and Twin and Nick over in Burley. These are super good guys that really know all about your equipment needs. And they've got everything that you possibly can need for all the jobs you're doing at Berry Equipment and Rental. Uh, located on Addison Avenue West in Twin Falls, South Lincoln in Jerome, and 159 West Highway 30 in Burley. Berry Equipment and Rental. Excellent, excellent people. Calls are welcome, 436-2244-1866-927-4587. You know, I want to say a real quick thank you while I'm waiting for my next phone call on Veterans Day. I want to say thank you to Mr. and Mrs. Harrison. I know they're listening this morning. And I also want to say a thank you to Linda Croft and the retired educators meeting yesterday. They had me over to speak to them. And they're just really nice folks. And uh, I had to mind my P's and Q's. I didn't want to get a ruler slapped on my knuckles. But God bless all of them. I really appreciate it. That was very nice. Thank you. Caller, good morning. You're on the air. How are you doing today? I'm great, thank you. Go ahead. Well, I listened to all my dad's war stories so much. He was in the Navy, and I told my brothers, I says, you know what, I feel like I was on that ship with him. He was on a troop transport. He was the, oh, the guy that took care of the engines. Mm -hmm. You know what, he's passed away, and I remember all those stories, and it's just really neat, you know. <laughs> you know, let me ask you a question right there. You bring up a very interesting point. I don't care if they were cooks. I don't care if they were mechanics. I don't care what their duties were. What their duties were. When they signed on and became a member of the military, who knows what they were going to end up doing. But you know, it's all parts of the wheel. It's all the spokes that come together to make the wheel roll in our military. And God and bless each and every one of them. And they made it work. There you go. And can I tell you something? I think I'm getting thin skinned because. When I saw your president over in China and he was wearing these Chinese pajamas, that kind of insulted me for some reason. Sir, I thank you for what you just said because honestly, if you could see my notes that I've got here for the program this morning, that is one of the things that I wrote about, that maroon and black Chinese shirt that highly offended me that uh, basically I call it siding up with the enemy. I didn't like that at all and I'm so glad you brought it up. I think Putin was looking at him thinking, you look like a fool, dude. <laughs> well, there's not much question about that, but thank you very much for your call. God bless you. That gentleman just brought up something that I, it just offended me. It offended me, and for you Obama lovers out there that seem to be dwindling in numbers, when he put on, and the man's right, it looked like a pajama top, uh, black and kind of a maroon shirt so that he could blend in with the hierarchy of the Chinese uh, presidential cabinet and etc. I found that to be very offensive. I think the President of the United States should have remained in his Western type attire, which is a nice dark suit, white shirt, tie, etc. But to change clothes and basically fit in with the Chinese leaders? No. Absolutely not. Why are we catering? Think about this just for a minute, and i got to give the weather forecast, and I'll take your calls. Why are we catering to a country that absolutely loathes us, hates us, and would like to see the demise of us, 
Why are we catering to them? Uh, they don't want anything to do with us. Nothing. They don't do anything to help us. They're not an ally. They're an enemy. And going over there, and uh, it, it just reeks of something going on under the table that you and I aren't going to know about until it's too late. Time for the weather. And the weather this hour is brought to you by Mad River Laser. I love this business. And all the buck knives now are on sale at 10% off with free engraving. Get over their great Christmas present ideas. And the Carhartt jackets are over there and ready to embroider with your name. Oh, yeah. And the wooden business cards. Love those. Love them. Got them. And people just are wild about them. Great, great item. All of this and more at Mad River Laser, 502 E Street in Rupert with Nicole and the crew. Stop in and see them today. Right now it's time for Michael Rogers Weather. Hello everyone, Michael Rogers. This is the ranch. I'm going to pull out your sweater. You might want to get your hoodie and stocking cap. Might want to kick in some gloves. It's going to be cold today. Um, you're going to get up to 35. That's it. 35. That's daytime high for the day. 15 for the Omanite Low. Now because the Magic Valley of South Central Idaho each location has their own different microclimate. Some temperatures may not be the same for all locations, but I'm passing on to you. I look for snow on Thursday. Two inches on the ground is over, said, and done. Then it's going to change the rain on Friday. Enjoy the weather. So what do you got? Thank you very much, Michael Rogers. Weather.com brought to you by Mad River Laser, 502 E Street in Rupert. Oh, yeah. Great folks. Thank you, Nicole. Appreciate it. All right, calls are welcome, 436-2244-1866-927-4587, Veterans Day 2014, and we'll take your calls if you would, please. I know so many vets in this area that uh, World War II vets, Korean War, uh, and I'm just honored to know them and have their friendship. And we've done so many interviews with uh, a lot of those great folks. If I were to try to make a list of all the people that I know on behalf of the Lunch Bunch and, and uh, all the other projects that I've been involved in and try to remember all their names, I couldn't. I couldn't. And I definitely do not want to hurt someone's feelings by not mentioning their name. But to all of you that are listening this morning, God bless you for what you have done for the United States of America and for all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Don't forget our friends at Burley Physical Therapy and Rehabilitation, 1263 Bennett Avenue, Suite 2 in Burley. Nick Greenwell and his staff. I believe on Thursday we're going to be talking to old Nick. I'll tell you what, Nick and Jordan and Jeff and Orlando and Emily and Kelly and Tia and Jared, all of those folks, and I know all of them, they are very dedicated to making you feel better. That's right. They know all about sports medicine. They know all about the exercises. They know all about the different comprehensive services that will help you get back to being you. That's right. Give them a call today for an appointment at 678-1191. I'm going to repeat that number. Tell them I told you to. 678-1191. Burley Physical Therapy and Rehabilitation, 1263 Bennett Avenue, Suite 2 in Burley. Really good folks. All right, give me a call, 436-2244-1-866-927-4587. I'd like to hear what your thoughts are on this Veterans Day. Good morning, caller. You're on the air. Good morning, Zeb. Hey, yeah. can I wish somebody happy birthday today? Well, I certainly hope so. Go ahead. I'd like to wish my father, Leonard Martin, a happy birthday today. Well... I extend the same wishes to a very nice man. Leonard Martin, it's your birthday today. God's blessings. That was nice. I, I really wish him to have a great, big, huge piece of cake and a dish of ice cream that's overflowing. Yep. We're going to go out, and the family and dad and I, we're all going to go out and celebrate his birthday this afternoon. So. Are you going to pick up the tab? Yes, we are. Okay. <laughs> well, we have to arm wrestle him to be able to do that, but I, I can almost beat him now. Well, I'll tell you something. I think the world and all of your dad, and so the very best, and please, would you extend to him, in case he's not listening, on behalf of Deanna and I, very happy birthday. 
We will. All right, sure. sir. You have a great day, Jeff. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Caller number two. Good morning. You're on the air. Good morning, Jeff. This is a 24-year veteran, long-time listener, first-time caller, but I want to thank you and all the people in this area for all the support you give to us and our organizations. Uh, you are very, very welcome. Uh, what branch of the service did you serve in, sir? I was in the Army for 24 years. Started out drafted in Vietnam. Like it's a bunch of state for another 22. In the Army for 24 years, uh, man, I, I just absolutely respect your service. Let me ask you this, if you don't mind. What was there? Uh, was there a single item or was there a multiplicity of things that made you want to stay in the Army? I think the comradeship with our fellow soldiers and the family-like feeling that we had. And basically, it's a pretty easy job to follow. Is it, is it, when you make a commitment like that, to stay 24 years in the service, it's got to be really tough on your family, it's got to be really tough on everything else as far as your lifestyle is concerned. Did you feel like you gave up a lot to serve for 24 years? Well, we gave up a lot, but we gained a lot also. My kids, uh... You got an education you can't get anywhere else. They've seen parts of the world that most people will never see. All oh, thanks to Uncle Sam. Uh, I both graduated from a German high school. And I think the uh, advantages outweigh the disadvantages myself. Well, I just want to say to you, sir, uh, God bless you. And thank you for your service to the United States. And have a blessed Veterans Day 2014. Okay, thank you. And again, thanks to all the people. When I sit in the parade there and everybody gets up when we come by on our float and salute to us, it just brings tears to my eyes. And mine also, sir. Mine also. Thank you so much. I appreciate your call. Call again. Thank you. Okay, bye -bye. Thank you. That was nice. Caller, good morning. You're on the air. Good morning, Seb. Hi, Carl. I just wanted to, uh, when I uh, come back, in uh, April of 68 to my mother's funeral uh, and I had to land in San Francisco I flew in from the Philippines and uh, there was people there spitting at me I was in uniform dress uniform and uh, I was ready to go over and take them on and a policeman come over he was close by anyway and he just kind of grabbed me by the arm gently he said, come on, Chief. He said, uh, um, if you go over there, he said, uh, I'd like to go with you. Because he said, I want to do the same thing you want to do. And uh, I was really angry. To this very day, I detest San Francisco. Why anybody would want to go there is beyond me. Mm -hmm. uh, ships aren't welcome there. Yeah. And Navy ships. And uh, that's, I just uh, get really upset when I think about uh, all of our uh, soldiers, sailors, Marines coming through there, and if they're in uniform, they're going to get spit at. You know, Carl, real quick, uh, I got another one waiting, but I want to ask you this. How can people in general be that stupid how can they absolutely have nothing between their ears so that they would uh, they live in the greatest country ever on the face of the earth they enjoy the freedoms and the amenities that no other land uh, has or appreciates and they can be that damn dumb that they would spit on the people that have risked their lives to protect them well um, I don't know people uh, even the military now are accepting gays and uh, I'm so glad I'm out. I'm just, um, but I have fond memories of uh, friends. I have one friend who died on the thresher. Uh, we're, uh, the guys themselves are kind of a close-knit community. Yeah. Uh, you hear the rivalry about the uh, Marine Corps and the, and the Navy, and, and I guess there kind of is, but some of my best friends are Marines. There you go. Uh, and... Uh, if somebody goes to pick on him, 
and I'm, if I'm there, they're picking on me too. Absolutely, Carl. Uh, yesterday was your birthday, and we wish you a happy birthday. I will reiterate I that again you today. You, I appreciate. That. And God bless you for your service to this great country. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Caller number two. I'll be right there. I've got to pay some bills. Stand by. Thirty seconds. And I want to remind everybody about Sophie's Chatterbox, five thirty East Street on the Square in Rupert. Oh my goodness, they're open Monday through Friday, six to six. Saturdays, six a.m. to two. And they. They've got a bakery over there. Oh, ho, ho, wedding cakes, cookie bars, homemade bread, delicious cinnamon rolls. You should see the size of the scones over there. Holy mackerel, they're huge. And the food is great. You're going to love it. Sophie's Chatterbox, 530 East Street on the Square in Rupert. Caller, good morning. Real quick, I got only uh, two minutes. Okay, I won't take two minutes. I want to thank... Some of the past vets, my dad and my uncle. I'd like to thank some of the present vets that are living today. George Faulkner for one. Yes. Russell Smith for two. Yes. Uh, Russell Smith again for three. Uh, my head just went blank, Zeb. Well, that's all right, Jerry. Your your heart is what I had, matters. I had a whole list of names here. Hugh Short, Doc Phillips. Yeah. You know, these guys gave their all for the service and they have their whole life they dedicated it to the community and to our country and you know I can't think of any better people in this world to honor than people like this I agree with you out of sight for what they've done because they've stood up for and they've protected this country every day of their life that I know of. I got to run to the news, Jerry. Thank you. You're very welcome. appreciate what you've done. Thank you, Jerry. I'll get off. I got to run to the news. May the Lord bless. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, really a nice man right there, Jerry Voss, and his thank yous to our veterans. And I hated to cut him off, but I've got to get a quick word in here for our dear friends and our major sponsor, your Magic Valley Les Schwab Tire Centers, with Lane and Rupert, Dave on Blue Lakes and Twin, Mike and Buell, Mike and Jerome, the Twist family and Paul, John on Poline in Twin Falls, and Randy on Overland and Burley. Get ready for winter driving. You heard Michael Rogers' weather, and you heard that we might get some snow, and you know it's going to get slippery so make sure you got all your traction tires for the bad weather ahead along with all your tire chains the best in batteries my goodness and make sure you have your brakes checked the best in brake services at all seven locations of your magic valley les schwab tire centers the very best people serving you for safe driving magic valley les schwab tire centers we'll be back in six don't go away Veterans Day 2014. Zeb at the ranch, good morning. Glad to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you so much for a great first hour with your thoughts on Veterans Day. Thank you. Zeb at the ranch, I'm Zeb Bell with our major sponsor, your Magic Valley Les Schwab Tire Centers, and of course all of our great advertisers, and they are Lee's Furniture, uh, Floors and More at 459 Overland and Burley, and another one of our great advertisers, of course, Western Waste Services. From the canyons of the Snake River, and the La Crosse Southern Idaho, we're all in the Georgia circle. Western Way Services, they've been our friends for a long time. We've been on their route service, getting rid of our garbage, and they're on time all the time, coming to get it. I'll tell you what, get on the route service today. Call them at 734-6969, and also check out all the dumpsters. they got them in various sizes. Maybe you're cleaning out the basement before the winter sets in, or maybe the garage or whatever. Hey, check it out today. Western Way Services, always at your disposal. Call 734 
888-900-5969. Don't forget, coming up on next Thursday, next Thursday, not this Thursday, next Thursday, November 20th, from 5 to 7 p.m., the Golden Heritage Senior Center, presenting the first annual Pilgrim's Pride Thanksgiving dinner. It's going to be fantabulous. It's only going to be 5 bucks a ticket, and we're going to have all kinds of great food, along with games, door prizes. Don't miss it. Open for all the public, all the families, especially kids. They'll have a ball there at uh, November 20th at 5 t- p.m. to whenever. Uh, it's going to last until whenever we run out of food or people stop coming in the door. It's going to be a lot of fun at the Golden Heritage Senior Center. And don't forget to handsome mortuary with our dear friend Joel Heward and his family and staff serving you. Handsome mortuary at 710 6th Street in Rupert. Number to remember, 436-5636. And they always treat people with the highest ethical standards with unquestioned integrity. Please, please give them a call and find out more information and a lot of the information we all should have on pre-planning of funerals at Handsome Mortuary, 710 6th Street in Rupert, Joel Heward, the manager. Good morning, caller. You're on the air quickly before we go to our guest. I have a little musical tribute to the veterans today. Uh, If you would, please, sir, go ahead. I climbed a mountain high before me spread America From north to south and east and west There on that mountain high while dreaming of America A song was born within my breast. My own America, beloved land of liberty, here in my heart there'll always be a song of love for you. From sun-kissed mountaintops, I see the sunlit plains below. I watch the mighty rivers flow through my America, where freedom is the watchword, where justice is for all, where men would rather die than let all glory fall. My own America, May God preserve thy destiny and help us save democracy the whole world through. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the outstanding voice and personality of my dear friend Keith Ramsey. God bless you for that uh, great addition to Veterans Day 2014. Thank you. Thank you, Zeb. God bless you. Wow, that uh, that really brought tears to my eyes. Absolutely excellent. Call it quickly. Good morning. You're on the air. Hello, Zeb. Yes, quickly. Go ahead, please. Hello? Hello, John. Yes, go ahead fast, please. Uh, Gina, evidently they can't hear me. Uh, is there any way you can boost that up? No, I can't. Is there? Yes, go ahead, please, go. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, maybe we could uh, have him call back in another line or something. Uh, I believe in the studio we have with us a gentleman, and I, I feel bad that we couldn't get that last call, but we have a gentleman that I've known ever since he was in grade school, and he has served our country of the United States of America. Ken Mort, good morning. How are you? Good morning, Zeb. I'm doing great. How are you today? I'm great. Ken, I want you, if you would, please, to give us your rank and the service that you were in, etc. Tell us all about it, please. Um, I retired as a staff sergeant uh, out of the, uh, from the Idaho Army National Guard with the U.S. Army. Uh, I active duty. Uh, was a military police officer for my last uh, six years in the, uh, with them. Uh, was Alpha a tanker with the M1A1 tanks driver I uh, did admin I I man of many many uh, skills while I was in Ken uh, today of all days a very special day Veterans Day when you woke up this morning and knowing of course it's Veterans Day what are some of the thoughts that go through your mind as far as your past service to this country 
Um, just how proud I am and stuff and that of what I've what I've accomplished and stuff and that uh, of being able to serve this great country and the the people and stuff and that. I mean, it's it's such an honor to be able to go and um, and say that I I stepped up. I I I signed that check and that that every soldier signs and stuff and that uh, that. Uh, I'm willing to place my life on the line for my country. You know, you said that you were involved in the tank corps and then also as a military policeman. And, uh, caller, I'll be with you in a minute. Stand by. But uh, being in a tank, and especially someone like me, Ken, that has extreme claustrophobia, that would not be a job that I would relish. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, yeah, it is. It is quite close quarters. Uh, I mean, I started off as a uh, as a driver, uh, which was which was quite fun. Uh, I mean, they actually had the, uh, probably the best seat in the house and stuff, and that for comfortability because you're more more reclined and and everything. Uh, but I've I've also was the loader, the gunner, the tank commander. I've I've done all all four positions in the tank, and it was um, quite an experience. I mean, yeah. You, your blood really gets pumping when that 120 millimeter main gun goes off when you're firing and, and I mean it's just uh, it's an adrenaline rush that is like no other. Let me ask you this uh, as far as the detriments uh, physically is there a lot of concussion uh, and the noise etc with the guns going off that you have a uh, kind of a hearing problem later on in life I mean tell me a little bit about that uh, yeah, I mean we we wear ear pl- or, uh, hearing protection plus on that we've got um, headsets on on that as well. So I mean we're trying to block out as much of the noise as possible. But I mean you're not you're not going to be able to uh, block it all out. Uh, but I mean it's uh, it comes with the job and uh, every once in a while and stuff and that all. I'll have to have my wife and kids and stuff and that repeat themselves a couple of times so I can actually hear what they're saying. But. Okay. Now, Ken, I've got a call, and we'll take that call and see if it pertains the to... The caller left. The caller left. All right, Gina, thank you very much. Ken, in the service, now, you were over, correct me, uh, were you in Iraq or Afghanistan? I was in Iraq. Okay. Tell us a little bit about this mess today, and nobody would know more about it than you would. We left, and I think, uh, I'll state my case here, and you can tell me I'm wrong, I think we should have left more of a residual force there, and we wouldn't be having a lot of the problems that we are today. Am I right or wrong? Um, I totally agree with you, Zeb. I mean, when I when I was over there, there was a, there was a lot that we were talking at uh, that we saw. I mean, when we were there and stuff, um, we we found that uh, there was only maybe one percent of the entire uh, population and that over there was involved in any kind of insurgent activities. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you didn't know who they were, where they were, or anything, because they blended in on that. They didn't wear uniforms like they did in Vietnam or in World War II or anything like that. I mean, it was, um, you were basically on that, uh, fighting a blind army. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, us moving out, I, w- I always felt and stuff in that by pulling all the troops out that uh, we were... We're basically leaving that area open on that to have the same thing happen again, uh, because the insurgency, the way the, the way these guys and stuff on that think on that are way different than what we think. We think of a short-term war. These guys are thinking of a hundred-year, two-hundred-year war. They, mm-hmm. they're, they've got it planned out and that so far out uh, and that in advance on that of how long they're willing to go and fight and everything that. Um, they take into everything into consideration, and I think when when we pulled out, Annette, they were they were expecting that, and we're just waiting and Annette, impatiently, like the uh, the cat waiting to pounce on that mouse and stuff, yeah. and as it pops out of its hole. Ken, I'm going to take a call, and we'll be right back with you. Ken Mort on the air with us, uh, Sergeant in the United States Army, and uh, caller, go ahead quickly. You're on the air. Yes, uh, Jim. As an officer and member of Post 17 of the American Legion, I want to thank you for your service to the armed forces. And there's more than one way to serve, and I think you're doing a great job. Well, that is so nice of you, and I have been honored by the vets in this area, and uh, so many kind words and so many graceful gestures, and for you to call and say that, it means an awful lot to me, and God bless you, and thank you for your call. 
No, okay then. Thank you very much. That was really nice. And uh, I have had uh, so many people with the American Legion come up and talk to me and, and say thank you, and I'm an honorary member, and I, I just absolutely thank you so much for what you've done. We're on the air with Ken Mort, uh, Staff Sergeant with the United States Army, military policeman, and also a tanker, as he calls it, a tank driver. Once you left, <coughs> excuse me, Ken, the tank corps, and was it, uh, were you a military policeman first or last? I was a military policeman last. My very first, my very first uh, job with the military was a truck driver. I transported uh, fuel and ammo and, and stuff like that uh, when I first started out and, and then got into the admin, or admin side, um, being able to um, do up awards. I mean, basically like an office clerk like you see with Klinger and, uh, 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 radar mm -hmm. and Max. I mean, Max is always one of my favorite uh, favorite TV shows to watch. Right. Uh, then I went into the tank, uh, into the uh, tank or cavalry tank regiment, and then uh, became a military police officer after that. Ken, with what's happening again? I want to go back to today. Uh, we are seeing a resurgence, if you will, of fifteen hundred troops, a commitment by Obama, and five billion with a B dollars. Um, myself personally, I think it's nothing more than just lip service. Fifteen hundred troops, I don't think is going to make the difference. The money bothers me because we've already left so many billions and billions of dollars, not only in the form of cash, but also equipment over there. What are your thoughts about this? You know, it's, it's, it's kind of hard for me to think about this and, that, uh, and really have a positive attitude on that. I mean, it's just my opinion is it's, it's somewhat of a waste because if you're not going to if you're not going to send enough troops over there to take care of the situation and that then why even send them over because all you're doing is putting uh putting more or uh more of them are going to be in harm's way without having having the backup that they're going to need because they're they're going over there and they're they're probably fighting on that 30 40 thousand on that people and stuff and that when they get there mm -hmm. not even more so i mean it's they can they can throw all this all this money out there, but if they don't got the people and stuff and that's going to and the resources to actually be able to do the job on that, they're not going to be able to accomplish it. You know, Ken, when you say the five billion dollars, I mean I can't fathom five billion. I can't even fathom a billion. But where is the money going to go? What will it be used for? Will it be for establishing new base camps? Will it be for construction needs? Will it be to go to the current uh, Regimes and government and local uh, city authorities. I mean, where does the money go? See, and that, that that's hard to say. I mean, when we were over there and stuff, and that we were we were getting on that um, our our fair share while we were deployed, and but it was broken out that we only had this much, or we had this amount of money and stuff, and had to be able to go towards towards maintenance. We had this kind of a budget to go towards this. I mean, we everything was set of what we could use it for. We couldn't just go and and. As they, as they call, piss it away. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you about this. Um, we'll take this caller, and then I want to talk to you about our veterans returning home in the time remaining. Caller, good morning. Quickly, you're on the air, please. You bet, Deb, it's just on again. Yes. You know, I've, I've had the privilege of knowing Ken and his beautiful family um, since he went was deployed. What a wonderful example of our military force. Absolutely. Um, We've kind of adopted um, he and his family. Um, they're they're more like our kids than anything. Um, and you know he is he's taken over. George uh, resigned the reins of the POW program to Ken. What a great tribute he does to our military. Absolutely, Donna. That was really nice of you to call and uh, say those nice things about Ken. He's a I've known him since he was a little whippersnapper. Yeah, he's still just as cute as he was back then, huh? I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> this is Henry, though. Guys. Love you guys. Bye. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, our history goes back a long way. I was your baseball coach. Yes, you were. Long yes. time ago. That's, that's been a long, long time ago. Yeah, I didn't have the gray hair then, did I? 
Actually, no, you didn't. No. <laughs> Ken, I actually had to think a little bit more here than what you do now. Uh, thank you very much, Ken. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about the returning servicemen and their treatment. Ken, I will do all I can on this program to help and further the cause for uh, care for our returning servicemen, uh, whether it's injuries, physical debilitation, or whether it's uh, uh, PTSD. What are your thoughts about the way that our servicemen are treated when they come home? You know, a lot of it depends on your on the area that you're going into. I mean, when I came or, uh, came home and everything, and I, I started getting all my stuff ready and, and started working with with my VA and that uh, representative and that here locally in the Minicaja area, and that uh, I mean. Uh, Georgia is what is such a wonderful Annette person to be able to work with. I mean, she's she was Annette prior military. I mean, and she just she stepped right up and started and was taking care of everybody she takes care of. But then you've got some of these bigger areas that when these troops get home, they've got uh, they don't have near the resources and stuff and out of, uh, the, of people and stuff and have to be able to step in and help get them taken care of. So, I mean, it's it's one of those that they it, it kind of. This, they're not benefits and stuff in that some, but it benefits others and uh, some of the, some of these and that troops and stuff that need uh, uh, that are in real need of this of this care when they get home for like PTSD the and that uh, any of the injuries that they've they've sustained stuff like that. I mean, they need to be able to get start getting that stuff worked on as soon as they get back. And unfortunately, I, I have to say and stuff in it that there are some instances where it's not necessarily the military's and at fault that they didn't get these services. I have known a few soldiers that when we got back off of deployment were like, you know, I just want to get home to my family. I am putting down I have nothing wrong right now and I'll take care of it later uh, type of attitude just because they've been away and then because they didn't want to get stuck for another uh, month or two at... Um, at one of the hospital locations and everything to uh, to get these things taken care of, but then you got those soldiers that did want that uh, want that stuff taken care of because they knew that it was going to have an effect on their family if they didn't. So I mean, it's it's one of those that it kind of goes both ways. It's on the on the soldier's responsibility, plus then it's also on on being able to get. Um, the medical uh, net attention that they need as well. Uh, Ken, we have another call, and then I want to come back and elaborate on that subject just a little bit. Caller, good morning. You're on the air. Yeah. When my husband came home from the service, uh, he's gone now, and this was before we were married. Uh, he went to church with his mom, and the uh, first guy to come up to him didn't even shake his hand. He said, well, I see you didn't get killed. I wasn't that a greeting. Mm. How terrible. Uh, I mean, for those that uh, don't have the respect and the knowledge as to what our servicemen go through, uh, sometimes saying nothing is better than saying the wrong thing. Wouldn't you agree, Ken? Right. Oh, right. I totally agree. But, you know, he never, he never did forget that. Yeah. He said, what a greeting. Absolutely. God bless yeah. you for your call this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Um, Ken, uh, what about the opportunities you said are there with the VA? But how can we, and you'd know this answer, how can we streamline the process so that people that need the help are getting the help when they need the help? One of my, or one of my uh, ideas on the whole issue is and that when, you, when they start getting all these, uh, all these packets and everything that they're getting at the VA hospitals and, and everything, that they have like a panel to go through and prioritize these things by and at the most severe to the not so severe and those that are in really dire need and at the, you can you can tell from their medical packet and at who is in who's in more need than than the other and try to get those that are in the in the major drastic needs what they need and at uh, immediately and then work on that from there and that down your down your packet yeah um, I mean down to the packets I mean we need to prior prioritize on that uh, the treatments that are needed and stuff and that by those that need them the most Ken uh, as I said I've known you since you were a very young man and uh, I certainly salute you for your service to our country 
And above all, I just want to say thank you. It is a treat for me to know you and your family and uh, what you're doing now to help with our veterans and to help with the POW MIAs. Uh, God bless you, my friend. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Zeb, and I really appreciate all the support that uh, you do for all the veterans as well. I'll be talking to you on Thursday for another aspect of your life, Dog Nation, but God bless you, Ken. Have a great day. You too, Zeb. Thank you. Uh, Caller, I've got to pay some bills. I'll be right with you. Stand by. I want to say thank you again <coughs> as I choke to death. Cheney Flooring and Home Design at 1228 Oakley Avenue in Burley. Look for the blue door for all your carpet and flooring needs, kitchen construction, home decor. Oh, these folks really know. They know whatever you need to make your house a home. They can help you. Just stop by Cheney Flooring and Home Design and you'll see what I'm talking about. And all the products are on sale right now. All the Christmas decorations are in. Hey, 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 Kyle and Whitney Cheney say, come on by. Cheney Flooring and Home Design, 1228 Oakley Avenue in Burley. Look for the blue door or call them at 678-6945. And let's see real fast. I want to remind you also about Whipple's Book Plaza. My goodness, I got phones going off here in the studio, cell phones, and I just got word that it's snowing over in Oakley. Holy smokes. Whipple's Book Plaza with Colonel Dale and the at 222 West 11th Street in Burley. My goodness, open Monday through Saturday, 10 to 5.30. And they've got so many unique gifts. Oh, my, for shopping early for the best selection. And floors and floors of books. Books, books, books all over the place. You better believe it. And cards and all kinds of jewelry. Everything stop in today at the Book Plaza at 222 West 11th Street in Burley. Proud sponsor of the American Boy Scouts and the Pioneer Hall. Hall of Fame, Whipple's Book Plaza, 222 West 11th Street in Burley. Call her real fast. Good morning. You're on the air. Hey, Zeb. It's me again. I, uh, talking to Sergeant Mort, I used to drive for him a time or two in the tank. But uh, also, you know, he's right. We we have a bang-up job over here at the vets in our area. We're very, very fortunate with the, with the VA that, that they're able to help. Uh, we're small enough, I guess. That's why it works. But I hear about problems in the bigger cities and in bigger populated areas. It makes me sad. But I'm just grateful for what we have here. But very, very well stated, my friend. And thank you for your service on this Veterans Day. God bless you. Thank you so much. So much. Very nice person. Very nice. Uh, in just a moment, we're going to talk to a lovely lady down in New Mexico, the Roadrunner State. Marita Noon will be with us momentarily. Stand by. I want to remind you, too, about our friends at Let's Ride. Oh, Nick and the crew were the funnest sold. Absolutely. They're going to be having an open house on November 21st and 22nd. Huge discounts. That means big discounts. Fantastic door prizes. Food for everybody. I'm going over. You better, too. And and uh, don't forget, they've got all the new snow machines over there. And great Christmas gift-giving ideas, you know, clothing and all the accessories and everything else. And great low interest rates. Check it out where the fun is sold. Let's ride. Highway 24 between Rupert and Burley, 436-4771. The number to call, let's ride. Really, really good folks. And when I talk about really, really good folks, I mean also Cameron and Siemens Insurance. As a matter of fact, I'm going to see those fellas this afternoon. When you think about life insurance, health insurance, retirement planning, or employee benefits, everything you need for security for your family and your home and your business, think about Cameron and Siemens Insurance. Highway 24 in Rupert. Absolutely. Dean and Todd, very dedicated and responsive to your needs and very accessible to serving you. Call the number 436-4424. 436-4424. Cameron and Siemens Insurance. Right now, we're going to go to the phone lines. And uh, of all the guests that I have on this program, uh, from sea to shining sea, this lady that's coming on now, I put her at the top of the list when it comes to knowing about energy. And I have the utmost respect for her. Out of Albuquerque, New Mexico, Marita Noon, good morning. How are you? I'm great, Zeb. Great to be with you. You know, Marita, you've written so many books, and you've been invited to speak at so many uh, different activities. Your book, Energy Freedom, is a book that I have right here on my desk, and I uh, occasionally refer to it on this program. 
But right now, right now is an opportunity that I don't think we're ever going to get again. And I'm not trying to sound negative. I think the Republicans and conservatives across this country and people that want to make the economy grow, they won during the election. And we cannot, we can't waste this opportunity. What are your thoughts? I agree 100% with you on that. I think it was a great victory for uh, the side of economic growth and uh, for energy freedom. In fact, the column I'm actually going to be working on writing it today it will be my column for next week on Breitbart.com. And it's going to be, uh, my working title is Six Things to Watch for an Energy Policy Under a Republican-Controlled Congress. And I think we're going to see some really big changes. I think that they are really seriously going to act. I think there's a lot of area of bipartisan uh, support. And I think we can really see some things happening in the next, just, you know, in a matter of months and in the next two years. Well, let me ask you this, and I think you know the political scene as well as anyone. Let's just talk about uh, Kentucky. Let's talk about the coal states. Let's talk about where they're fracking, etc. Are there enough Democrats that divorce themselves so far from Obama that they might be on the hook to go along with a Republican energy plan? I believe so, and I think the big, um, oh, it's not the right word, but the common denominator, the ally for us, is the unions. The, re the Republicans and the unions have historically uh, been on opposite sides of policy, but I think here's a real opportunity for us uh, to, to come together because the unions, I, I'm currently in uh, New Orleans meeting with some people from the electricity sector, and we were all together, the people I'm with now, we were all together in Atlanta back in July for the EPA hearing about the Clean Power Plan, and we were just talking about the unions that were there and the presence that they had and there's a picture I have that kind of went viral as a tweet as much as anything I've ever had go viral where I'm with about 20 union guys wearing their t-shirts that say United Mine Workers Union and they loved me they loved what I said up front and so I have a picture with them making kind of a seat with their hands and I'm seated on their hands with my arms up around their shoulders and they're holding me up in the air. And so I think the unions, um, who have really seen a lot of loss of jobs, not just in the mining area, but also in um, the pipe fitters and the welders and the people that build the power plants, um, there's, a, there's a big uh, opportunity for cooperative effort there. When you look at this situation, uh, and I was astounded by the uh, complete tidal wave of the vote towards the Republicans, but I've said on this program, and I want to get your response, it wasn't really that people loved the Republicans and they were all gushy and mushy and loving about what the Republicans stood for. I think, honestly, the vote was against the ideology and the severe cutbacks of Obama's uh, administration. What do you think? Oh, exactly. I mean, they, what they've seen is that these plans have not helped, and in fact, they have hurt. And so I think people were voting more for a different direction yeah. than they were voting for Republicans. They know the direction that we have been headed isn't working. Uh, again, my expertise is energy, but for example, uh, in Massachusetts this winter, they are facing a 37% increase in electricity prices over just last winter and you know there this, this these policies are coming to fruition and people are beginning to feel the pain when you look at the administration right now like a uh, rat cowering in a corner because they got whooped they got whooped really bad are you concerned that this man right now obama will lash out at anything with his pen and his phone using executive powers and also the money from people like Tom Steyer's, et cetera, that's unlimited, and uh, team up with the environmentalists and make things even worse for us. 
Well, yes and no. I do believe he is definitely going to lash out. And again, you know, my expertise is energy, but he's threatened to do this with immigration, etc. And so I, I do think we're going to see a flurry of executive orders coming out of the Obama White House. But those executive orders all have to have funding. And that's where the Republicans will have uh, some leverage that, and one of the things I mentioned at the beginning here that my column I'm going to be writing for next week is six energy policy changes we can expect to see. And one of them has to do with EPA, and the, the, the way to control that is to pull funding. And uh, there's certainly plenty of talk about that right now. And I, and I think that, uh, and, and the other one that I project is uh, the Endangered Species Act, which has been used as a funding mechanism for environmental groups for, not for years now. And uh, I, I don't think we will do away with the Endangered Species Act, but I think we will definitely see some reform coming uh, on the Endangered Species Act that takes away that ability of the environmental groups to use the Endangered Species Act as both a weapon against economic development and takes away their ability to use it as a funding mechanism. Marita, if you all of a sudden were put in charge and uh, had the ability with the stroke of your pen or phone to lead the Republicans on a resurgence of an energy program, by the way, we haven't had one for seven years, what would you do first and what would be the most uh, innovative idea that you have to get this country back on track energy-wise so that our economy would pick up because of a better energy program? Well, that's a really big question. I can tell you what I would do first. I can't tell you what the, 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 certainly would not be the most innovative. Uh, but what I would do first is approve the Keystone Pipeline. And the Republicans seem on board on that. So I'm not unique or special with that thought. But certainly, uh, I think approving the Keystone Pipeline is something that we're going to see coming out in the first quarter of 2015 uh, and coming out strong. And a lot of people don't understand how, what they can do since the president has to approve any pipeline that crosses an international border. But uh, they can change that law is what they can do. And uh, then the president will be forced to either agree by signing it or disagree by vetoing it. But I also believe we have enough Democrats that may sign on to have a veto-proof majority on that one. And uh, so I, I think the other thing would be a, a reversal of some of the climate change policies uh, that are the underpinning of a lot of bad energy policy in this country. And I think that's the, the area that I personally would look at first. Now, you mentioned uh, climate change, and I've got to, I, I'd be a fool if I didn't ask you because you know so much about this. I need to ask you, we're looking at all indications, like this morning in Minneapolis and around the surrounding area of Minnesota, they've got over 16 inches of snow, a very early uh, snowfall for that amount this early in the season. We're looking at cold temperatures that are supposed to permeate all of the United States this year, much colder winter. And the Al Gores and the Tom Steyers, how are they going to get their point across to further and perpetrate climate change? Yeah, it's a good mystery, and I think that's why the cl issue of climate change is on the bottom of all polling. Every poll that's done when they ask what issues should government be focusing on and climate change is on that list, Climate change comes in dead last because the American public is smarter than they give us credit for. They realize that you know, all of these predictions that they have given, the Tom Sires and the Al Gores, etc., they have not come to fruition. And the, uh, the so-called green energy uh, transformation in Europe has not worked out well. And so a lot of those things, I don't know what they're going to do for the future to try to push this, but, you know, as long as they've got the mainstream media on their side, they can continue to make claims. And uh, people don't pay enough attention, unfortunately, uh, to, to hear any different. But for those who are paying attention, they realize that this whole agenda 
uh, has, has really fallen apart. Is there any hope, in your opinion, that many of the outdated, many of the almost ramshackle refineries can be rebuilt and possibly even new ones constructed when we see a resurgence of an energy program with the Keystone Pipeline and other oil fields being established? Or is that going to be an issue the environmentalists will always put thumbs down on? Well, they will always uh, they will always put thumbs down on it. Uh, always put thumbs down on it. But it's, uh, it's a matter of uh, heading forward, especially if the Republicans take the White House in 2016, which I believe they have a strong potential of if the policies are changed so that we suddenly see a real economic resurgence so that there is a dramatic contrast between policy A and policy B. And uh, if, you know, the environmentalists, will, I believe, will always oppose refineries and uh, building new refineries, new pipelines. It's a matter of how much control the environmentalists have. And they, uh, what I believe we're going to see is environmentalists beginning to work harder on state levels and through referendums and things like that. Uh, I'm more on the local level because with the Republican-controlled Congress, they're going to have less power on a federal level, even though they still control the White House, basically. Um, the environmentalists will have less power on a federal level, and I, I believe we're going to be seeing um, a transitioning to more local-level uh, initiatives. When you talk about the Republican Party and you talk about 2016, I have to ask you this. Of all the people that you know, of all the meetings that you go to, which possible Republican would be the best presidential nominee that understands energy and would have and create the best energy program? Well, it's, you know, it's hard to say. Bobby Jindal comes to mind. I don't personally think he can probably win, but he's from Louisiana. He understands the, the energy industry and the value that that brings. And, you know, that's what Mary Landrieu has trafficked on and gotten reelected on all these years. I, I think John Kasich is another strong possibility on that. Um, he's been good on the renewable portfolio standard and, and putting a pause on that, I believe he's the only governor in the country that put a pause on their renewable portfolio standard. So those are two names that are banned, that are you know out there that I think would would have strong energy policies in a 2016 election. What about, uh, I want to go back just for a moment, if I could, Marita, and talk about the environmental movement in this country. Uh, they have so much power and they have so much money. Uh, how can we, common citizens, how can we fight this to get an economy and an energy program that's going to put us back on a progressive movement towards uh, trying to better our nation instead of being regressive? Well, you know, I think I think the uh, Republican takeover of the Senate is a huge step on that. Realize that the, the Environment and Public Works Committee in the Senate, the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee, the current chairman is Barbara Boxer. And Barbara Boxer is the number one supporter of the president's environmental policies. The new chairman under the Republican-controlled Congress is going to be James Inhofe, or Senator Inhofe from Oklahoma. And he is the number one opponent of the president's policies. So just on that one committee, we have a great example of some of the change that we're going to see. And let me mention um, on the environmentalists and their funding, and you might want to interview the gentleman I'm about to mention, Deb, if you haven't already, but my friend and mentor, Ron Arnold, has just produced an e-book. It's just an e-book. It's not in print, but it's available on Amazon. And unfortunately, I'm drawing a blank on the exact name of it. But if someone was to Google uh, Ron Arnold Amazon and just the word green, I'm positive you would find it. And uh, he's just put out this book. Uh, that he's, he's the, honestly, the number one expert in the country on green group funding. You know, when you talk about green funding and the Obama administration, uh, are we going to see another hard full court press for more wind and solar wastage uh, to the tune of billions of dollars in the next two years? 
Well, I think we'll see a push for it. I don't know that it'll get through. Um, with a production tax credit for wind energy that expired on December 31st, 2013, is still expired. And they have been all year trying to get it reinstated retroactively. And we're heading into the lame duck session. I'd really encourage your listeners to call their senators and congressmen and say, do not approve uh, a production tax credit extension for wind. It has expired. Leave it expired. But this lame duck session will be, I believe, the last big push for that because while the group, while there may be efforts on that, Republicans, for the most part, will not approve it. And we have a few people like Steve King in Iowa who, um, you know, is real fiscally strong, solid conservative, except for when it comes to wind energy. And the harsh reality is we have built a false economy based on government subsidies for green energy. And if you take those subsidies away, the reality is people will lose jobs, and that's harsh. Absolutely. And so uh, Congressman Steve King in Iowa, for example, um, does the right thing for his state by supporting that, but he does the wrong thing for America. Let me check with my engineer, Gina. Do we have a call uh, waiting? No. All right. Thank you very much. Let me ask you, Marita, what about you personally? I don't know of anybody that's more knowledgeable and more vocal and very articulate about energy. Have you any aspirations about maybe throwing your hat in the ring and becoming part of the new Republican uh, organization as far as energy is concerned? Well, you're very kind. I'm on a show in Las Vegas, Nevada, frequently, and the, the host of that program often says, you know how we'll know when we have the right re right president in this country? And his answer is, when Marita Noon is Secretary of Energy. <laughs> No, I don't really. I, 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 I don't really want to work that hard. Well, you do plenty, and uh, I want to say thank you very much for being on the program this morning. And we have one, one minute, and we'll take a quick call. One moment. Go, go ahead, caller, please. Quickly. Yes, Marina, the, the original founder of the uh, Weather Channel was uh, Mr. Coleman, and he was a scientist. Right. And lately he was interviewed on CNN, I think, and he had a stinging rebuke of global warming. And he says there is no science to defend it. There never has been global warming. There never will be. And I was just curious as to what you thought. I'll hang up. Uh, good question. Go ahead, Marita, please. Yeah, thank you. He did a brilliant job on CNN, and I would encourage listeners to Google that. John Coleman, founder of Weather Channel, CNN. I'm sure you can find the segment. And uh, he was brilliant on that. And uh, I totally agree with, agree with him on that. Joe Bastardi is another uh, weatherman who's really strong on that topic as well. Absolutely. Marita, God bless you, and uh, the very best for your blog and your books and your writings and all your workings for us, the American Citizens for Better Energy Program. Thank you so much for being on the program this morning. My pleasure, Zeb. Thank you. Thank you. Marita Noon from Albuquerque, New Mexico, and uh, her book called Energy Freedom. And uh, believe me, get a copy of that book, and you'll understand why I'm so high on that gal. She really knows all about energy. Speaking of energy, I better get the weather on here real quick or I'm going to be really late. And the weather this hour is brought to you by Lennox Home Comfort Systems. Whether it's a gas furnace, air conditioner, or a heat pump, you and your family will enjoy the comfort through our friends at Ramsey Heating and Electric at 2600 Overland Avenue in Burley. You better believe it. 678-0459, Ramsey Heating and Electric. And now here's Michael Rogers' weather. Hello, everyone. Michael Rogers is at the ranch. Want to pull out your sweater? You might want to get your hoodie and stocking cap. You might want to kick in some gloves. It's going to be cold today. Um, you're going to get up to 35. That's it. 35. That's daytime high for today. 15 for the overnight low. Now, because the Magic Valley of South Central Idaho, each location has their own different microclimate. Some temperatures may not be the same for all locations, but I'm asking on to you. I look for snow on Thursday. Two inches on the ground is over, said, and done. Then it's going to change the rain on Friday. Enjoy the weather. So with you guys. Thank you, Michael Rogers. Weather brought to you by Lennox Home Comfort Systems through our friends at Ramsey Heating and Electric at 2600 Overland Avenue in Burley. 
Oh, my goodness. I also want to remind you real quick about customer appreciation sale. Where? At Lee's Furniture Floors and more. My goodness, you can save a lot of money. They appreciate you. They appreciate your business. They appreciate you as a customer. And they have prices marked way, way down. They've got queen mattress sets starting at just $199. And they've got super low prices on uh, carpet and flooring deals. My goodness sakes. And they've got all the sofas and love seats and sectionals and sleepers. You can save up to near 50% off. Oh, my. You better stop in today. Customer appreciation sale from some really nice folks at Lee's Furniture Floors and more at 459 Overland in Burley. Lee's Furniture. You stop in and see them today. Calls are welcome on this Veterans Day 2014, and uh, I am very, very thankful for all the people that have called in so far. There are many, many activities going on today, and it was really tough uh, trying to find people that weren't already committed to various Veterans Day uh, activities to come on this program this morning, and I certainly want to say thanks to all those that helped me just the same, and uh, I know that there are the one that I went to a couple of years ago was at Declo Elementary School and they are having a veterans program at 11 o'clock this morning at their gymnasium and I just want to give kudos to all the schools that are involved in a Veterans Day program thank you Thank you so much for honoring our veterans and these kids will know and appreciate what our veterans have done to keep that red, white, and blue flag flying high over this great country, the United States of America. God bless you. Uh, calls are welcome. Give me a jingle. While I'm waiting for your call, I want to remind you, too, about the Pilgrim Pride Thanksgiving dinner at the Golden Heritage Senior Center on Overland and Burley on Thursday, November 20th. And uh, once again, Thursday, November 20th from 5 to 7 p.m. Oh, my goodness. $5 a ticket is all it's going to cost. Turkey, ham, and all the trimmings. And, Deanne, we have somebody here if you'd hurry in the other way. And don't forget, turkey, ham, everything for you. I had to call the end. We had a guest coming into our studio. And uh, don't forget, bring your family and join in. Door prizes, raffles, and fun games, everything at the Pilgrim Pride Thanksgiving dinner. I didn't see her go out to open the door. I didn't know if she heard you or not. Uh, good morning, caller. You're on the air. Zeb, I, it's early winter, late fall. But Zeb, there's a lot of horses around the country as I drive around and look that are not getting anything to eat. And I think we need, some of these people need to get woke up something. If they're going to have a horse or an animal, they need to take care of it and feed it. You know, Bob, uh, I too have noticed, and I've been uh, around the area probably as much or more than most because of all my travels, I've seen, and I won't uh, pinpoint exactly where some of the locations are, but I've seen some horses that absolutely they'd love to get reacquainted with a bale of hay. Uh, I'm just wondering what, what can be done. Well, I think, first of all, uh, find out the direct coordinates and the address and turn it into, if you think the horses are being abused or starved, be sure and turn it into the uh, sheriff's department and let them start the ball rolling. And uh, I'll help as much as I can on this end, because if you can't afford them, sell them. And if you can't afford them, you better feed them. Well, that's my sentiment tonight. You know, I just... And then... The bad part about it, I see these horses just nothing to eat, but I see their owner running around and his belly is hanging over the top of his belt. Yeah. He, he eats. Why can't the horse eat? No question, Bob. I agree with you 100%. And like I said, I'll extend any help I can on that issue. Uh, I personally, uh, about a year and a half ago, turned in some folks uh, to the Cache County Sheriff's Department. And uh, they took action, were very diligent about making sure that the owner uh, was either a put up or shut up situation. So, whatever you can do, get involved, be vocal, and don't let it die, please. 
Okay. All right, Bob. Have a good one. Happy Veterans Day. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Call her real fast. Go ahead. You're on the air. Zeb, it's my honor to get on and say thank you to all the veterans who are out there, those who have served and those who are now serving. I have several people within my family that have served and are still serving. And I know the sacrifice that their families are going through. And I appreciate and am very thankful for all they've done. Very well stated, my dear friend, and uh, I appreciate your call. I always do when you call in, but this morning even more specially than ever. Thank you very much. Thank you. You betcha. Thank you very, very kindly. To everybody that's called in this morning regarding Veterans Day, I know it's a special day with uh, fond memories and remembrances of uh, loved ones, family members, and maybe buddies that have served in the military with you or that went off to war. And that's the case in my uh, point of view. I remember many, many from high school and college. And we've talked about it on this program that uh, donned the uniform of the United States military and went over and helped protect me and you. God bless all our veterans. Coming up next hour, Dr. History, and I always look forward to Dr. Ken Turner with Dr. History. And uh, then at 10.30 this morning, we're going to have a gentleman on the program that is going to be talking about the Democratic defeat in this last election and how he thinks it's going to be a lot longer lasting than what we think. Mm -hmm. Noah Rothman is going to be on the program. Stay tuned. Dr. History is coming up next. my welcome back our number three and look what the cat dragged in we'll talk to him in just a minute my dear friend dr history is here holy buckets can't wait to get him on the air but first and foremost i want to tell you what's going on over at the chadwick sports grill today is what is today dn tuesday yeah uh chicken and bacon pitas Ooh. Now that sounds good on a cold day. Chicken and bacon pitas with a choice of potato and super salad. My goodness, that's a good special. I'm going to get over there and try that. Chadwick Sports Grill, 139 West Main in Burley. Always great food. Everything on the menu, delicious. Super folks and a great environment at the Chadwick Sports Grill in Burley. You stop in and see them today. Also, let's see, I want to remind everybody i got to talk about that Lennox Home Comfort Systems. Don't forget whether it's a gas furnace, air conditioner, or, of course, a heat pump. Stop over to our friends at Ramsey Heating and Electric at 2600 Overland Avenue in Burley. For all the Lennox equipment for your home, Lennox and Ramsey Heating and Electric at 2600 Overland Avenue in Burley, 678-0459. Holy cow. Now i got to make sure i got the right microphone on. Say something there for a minute. Good morning, Zeb. Well, I do. Here is the one, the only, world famous, infamous, my goodness, Dr. History. How are you? I'm doing great this morning. How are you getting along? I'm not bad. Uh, a little bit chilly. Did you see the picture, by the way, that was taken by the National Wire Sur or Weather Service about the cold front when it came across the Canadian border down here into the United States? It looked like it was going to get very cold. Oh, it did. It dropped 50 degrees in less than 24 hours up in that area. They won't be golfing today. No, I don't think so. But uh, you, of all people, you had to brag a little bit and wear your cap in that shows that you're one of the mucky mucks of the national senior games. Well, you know, you got to brag a little when you get a bronze medal. That's right. I'm proud to look at my wife laughing at him. Uh, no, I'll tell you what, when you get a bronze medal, that shows. How many guys competed against you, by the way? Well, let's see. I got third place. I think there was uh, three. No, uh, no. no, come on. <laughs> you know, actually, uh, I'm not sure. I know there's at least a dozen to 15 oh, really? in my age group. Do they come from all over the world? Or yes, just... they do. Canada, really? uh, back east, uh, all over the United States. And um, some of the volleyball teams are actually uh, uh, international. Japan, uh, South America. Oh, really? 
So it's quite a, a big event down there, the Huntsman World Senior Games. Do the guys wear the same kind of short shorts that the girls wear? I hope not. No. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> uh, Dr. History, and uh, we might point out that uh, this program has been fairly well accepted all over the world, literally. How many different countries now are listening, and how many hits have we had on the uh, Dr. com? Okay, we're over 70,000 hits in about 55 different countries. 55 countries. And one Do you of the realize we could control the UN? That would be great. I think it would be. <laughs> and one of the reasons I came today, Zeb, is because our students in Peking University in Beijing in China. in China are having a little bit of a hard time hearing me when I call in. Really? So that's why I wanted to come out here to the studio today, and hopefully they'll be able to hear a little better. Now, can you say anything in Chinese to welcome them this morning? No. Okay, that's good. Okay. <laughs> what kind of a story are we going to have this morning? Well, you know, we haven't had a really good uh, stage robbery for quite a while, so uh, we're going to do a stagecoach robbery that actually occurred here in Idaho. Really? Yeah. So Now, where much did the stages primarily run? Well, the, the one we're going to talk about went from Salt Lake to up into Montana to Virginia City. Oh, so it, did it take the route like over by Montpelier, Malad, over in that area? Uh, up the Portneuf River, I up see. through Pocatello, and up that direction. I see. Okay, go ahead. All right. Well, the gold rush into the Dakotas, Idaho, and Montana started a decade after gold was discovered at Sutter's Mill in California. The roads to and from the diggings went through hundreds of miles of the most desolate country imaginable. But as it happened, particular places seem to be ideal for robbers to congregate and to do their business. Well, these places were inevitably called a robber's roost, and in the north, this gathering place was at a nor at the northern mouth to the Port of Canyon. Mm -hmm. And when a robbery in the canyon turned deadly in 1865, Montana's infamous vigilantes became interested. They tracked down the murderers and pulled them up by the neck uh, by uh, with the help of a tree. Uh, a little uh, necktie party. A little necktie party. The, the vigilantes didn't look fondly upon uh, people who robbed. I see. So, now, the town of Virginia City and Bannock sprang up overnight in Montana near the Rick's diggings, and it became necessary to establish stagecoach service to these boom towns. So, a stage company provided service between Salt Lake City and Virginia City in 1863. Now, Ben Holiday's line established a stagecoach line to bring in miners and payrolls and to take out the gold dust and other express. Mm -hmm. Well, Ben Holiday of the Overland Stagecoach Company was awarded on July 1st, 1864, the lucrative U.S. mail contract of $13,271 per year for four years. Wow. So back then, that would have been, you know, a pretty good sum. 13000 13, back 000 then? Back in what was that, 18? 1864, so at least 10 times that amount now. Oh, absolutely. At least. Yeah. So, but a stage line needed three things. It needed a mail contract uh, to survive. It needed express business to make some profit. And then, of course, it needed passengers to make the line a success. And Overland had all three of these to make it a success. Now, one route starting from Salt Lake City went to Bear River uh, in present-day Utah. It continued into present-day Idaho, uh, up into Pocatello. It crossed the Snake River and then went on into Montana. One road led to Virginia City and the other to a place called Bannock, Montana. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, traveling in a southerly direction, the line divided uh, with uh, the through coach going southwest into Salt Lake City, while another coach uh, went west up to Boise. I see. Now, at the northeast end of Port of Canyon, there was a swing station that came to be known as Robber's Roost because it was the point on the trail beyond which the southbound treasure-laden coaches were most vulnerable to robbery. And it was at this station that robbers watched for signs of treasure board. And I actually looked on a map last night, Zeb, and there, right in that area, there's a canyon, a road called Robber's Roost Canyon. To this day, it's named that, right over in that area. In, in, in what area is that again? Over uh, south of uh, Pocatello. South of Pocatello. Are you talking possibly out towards uh, Aberdeen or American Falls? Uh, no, more south, towards Salt Lake. More south, uh, towards Salt Lake. Yeah, okay. it's actually uh, just east of the freeway that heads out of Pocatello. 
towards Malad. I see. And they so, had a place called Robber's Roost over there. Yeah. Hmm. So Port of Canyon was soon infested with these robbers and it, because it was the ideal place to rob the coaches before they reached Marsh Valley, some distance south of Port of Canyon. Wouldn't it have been further ahead for the stagecoach lines to provide, like, outriders or scouts or somebody? It would have saved a lot of money, wouldn't it? You know, you would think they would, but usually they just had the driver and the uh, shotgun. Shotgun, yeah. yeah. But it was at, at Marsh Valley that the contents of the stagecoach were divided uh, after they'd robbed the coach. and They still do that today over They there. still rob the, yeah, yeah you got to watch where, <laughs> where you're riding. <laughs> but, uh, you know, passengers for Salt Lake City continued on the original coach while another coach was started for Boise with passengers, mail, and express for that city. Well, the stage line was well equipped uh, this particular day uh, with fine Concord coaches pulled by four carefully matched mules. And on July 10th, 1865, loaded with the mail and seven passengers, the coach left Virginia City for Salt Lake City and Boise mm-hmm. with a guy by the name of Frank Williams driving. Now, keep that guy in mind, Frank Williams. Okay. And a guy named Charlie Parks was riding on the left side as the shotgun messenger, they called him. Uh-huh. Well, several of the men, uh, the passengers, had hidden among their luggage 65,000 in gold dust, <laughs> packed in cans, which at uh, the time's rate of $13.50 per ounce weighed a total of nearly 5,000 ounces in gold. Oh, my goodness. So they also had among them more than 5,000 in treasury notes. Now, the gold which was being transported for a number of successful miners in Virginia City was to be forwarded to the east after reaching Salt Lake City. Well, the men, because of the great treasure in their care, were all well armed. They all had guns. Uh, They had guns either on them or placed close at hand within the coach. So here we are, July 13th, 3 p.m. in the afternoon. The coach was heading southwest at a pretty good pace. The men aboard had seen the same suspicious-looking man on horseback pass the stagecoach a couple of times. Mm-hmm. However, when nothing happened, they relaxed a bit but still remained alert. Now, Williams, the driver, donned a bright red neckerchief. Now, keep that in mind. Okay, Williams, I've got a lot of things i got to keep track okay, of. Okay, Williams and the bright red neckerchief. Yeah. Okay, for this leg of their journey and had his hand full of rains as the coach approached a place in Port of Canyon. A few miles past the station where the road was thickly walled with brush, the coach had just come under a projecting rock on one side and was approaching a clump of trees along the stream on the other side when all of a sudden a man stepped out of the trees and ordered halt. Uh Uh-huh. And they halted. And that's going to come to, you'll see why here in a little bit. Okay, I'm on pins and needles. All right. Um, but, a, but a moment, six more men stepped into view from the brush, and each man, with his fat face blackened as a disguise, was holding a shotgun pointed at the driver and the shotgun, or the messenger. Or they, had a, or they were sh- uh, pointing at the coach. Well, they ordered the passengers to get out, and within the coach, there was a scramble as the passengers retrieved their weapons. Well, one or more of them started firing at the, riber, uh, the robbers, but without effect, and the robbers returned fire and riddled the coach with buckshot, which instantly killed two men. Oh, my. Mortally wounded, wounded two more and inflicted a pretty serious wound, but not fatal, on the shotgun guy, Parks. Mm-hmm. Well, once the shooting stopped, uh, two men jumped from the interior and escaped uh, from the from the stagecoach and ran into the brush. Well, the robbers quickly reloaded their double-barrel shotguns and fired at the the guys fleeing, but they didn't get them. And uh, anyway, so they uh, all the carpet sacks were rifled for gold dust and valuables, and all the cans of gold dust were found uh, in the back of the stage and passenger compartment. And uh, anyway, the robbers next went through the bodies of the passengers, taking everything of value from their pockets, and then cut open the mailbags. Now, also, there appeared to be about 15 gold bars that were in this uh, robbery. Okay. Well, and that's going to, I'll talk about that again. you got a lot of things for me to remember. That's right, so don't forget. Okay. Okay, the leader then called for the horses and another man, and the eighth uh, in the party who had been holding their horses in the brush a few yards off, brought them forward, the men mounted, and rode off. 
Well, as soon as the road agents were out of sight, a passenger by the name of Carpenter uh, secured one of the stage mules and rode several miles back to the port of Canyon Station. Canyon uh, or Carpenter assembled a small party of men and returned to the scene of the murders, where they collected their dead, gathered uh, the mutilated male, harnessed a team to the coach, and returned to the station. Now, the frequency and the boldness of the robberies in this rough country had encouraged the citizens to form a vigilante committee. Mm -hmm. And they'd been active in the community for months. Uh, the members of the committee took particular interest in the Portniff robbery of July 13th because of the loss of life and everything that was stolen, the amount. So there had been a number of previous robberies in that vicinity, one as early as 1863, and many a man had been pulled up a tree or dangled from the gallows uh, trying to because, uh, by the vigilantes trying to deter some of these road agents. Okay. Okay, now back to Frank Williams. Oh, yeah, now wait a minute, wait a minute. Frank, i got to remember this. Frank Williams and the red neckerchief. And he was the driver. Yeah. Okay, well, when he got back to town, so to speak, he got cussed out by the line superintendent for failing to offer resistance. So he soon quit the stage line, drew his pay, and started for Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Williams was suspected of helping in the robbery because oh. with all the shooting, uh, he had not suffered a scratch. Well, now he was sitting right up there on top of the stage. Right, with bullets flying all over, but uh, nobody, uh, nobody got him. I see. Okay, so a member of the vigilante committee was assigned to watch Williams and followed him uh, through Salt Lake City and on to Denver, Colorado. Now, Williams, over the next few months, began spending lavishly on liquor and other forms of entertainment, going through several Why thousand... Why don't you elaborate on that entertainment just for a little bit? I think probably singing and dancing. I say singing and dancing. Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers. Right, you know, yeah. uh, things like that. Sure. So, yeah. And uh, anyway, he went through several thousand dollars, uh, even though his total worth from his stage line pay would have been less than $200. Really? So the Montana man sent word to his committee and a party of men joined him in Denver. Now, Williams must have become a little suspicious because he suddenly packed his gear and started out of the country. Mm -hmm. However, he was overtaken, he was arrested, and confronted with the suspicions of the vigilantes. You know, and I'm thinking maybe he was hoping for a little uh, sympathy, but Williams uh, fell to his knees, he was conscience-stricken, and provided a full confession. Uh -oh. He just spilled his guts. Yeah. He admitted that his bright red neckerchief... Okay, remember I told you about I that? I remember. Was a signal to the gang that the treasure was aboard. I see. And then he named the eight men who, with him, had participated in the robbery and also named at least seven other members of the gang. Okay, now we're going to leave just a little bit. i got to give you a little background here. Okay. Uh, Williams identified the Portniff robbers as members of a gang called the Updike Gang. Now, he told where the main body of the murderers could be located in Colorado and revealed that it was in his, that was his part in the robbery to drive the coach into the ambush, ambush in a manner that would arouse the least suspicion and then to be certain that the horses didn't bolt and carry the stagecoach out of, out of danger. So he sat up there on the stagecoach. Holding the horses. Holding the horses so everybody could shoot. Sure. Oh, he, my yeah. goodness. He was the driver that didn't do anything well, except hold the, the horses. What about the shotgun guard, though? I mean, man... Uh, he got shot, didn't he? He did, which I think must have disabled him because, you know, by that that point he just probably decided that was enough. Well, wouldn't you? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> With eight guns pointed at yeah. you. Yeah. So, anyway, so Williams had done his job well. He'd been paid off in treasury notes, nearly all of which he'd already spent. Uh, but the vigilantes took... What did he spend that money on? Uh, just good, fun, honest <laughs> I see. times. Okay. <laughs> The vig <laughs> Zeb, you're going to get me one of these days. <laughs> you know, the vigilantes took Williams to a place called Cherry Creek, which, which was a short distance southeast of Denver, and it was a popular place for hanging people. Well, they selected a good old sturdy cottonwood tree, and on January 4th, they pulled him up and tied off the loose end and left him hanging. Popular place to just hang around, huh? Just he was hanging around yeah. where others had been hanging around, I too. See. So they got him. They got him. So, anyway, the Montana party remained in Colorado and took the trail of the other murderers. Yeah. 
Now, the Montana vigilantes captured and hung five others of the Portnoff gang. Oh, my goodness. Uh, over there by Denver. Now, after dispatching all the Portnoff fugitives they found in Colorado, the vigilantes returned to Montana and began to watch this guy Updike. You see, he wasn't with them. He was, he was, it was their gang, but he wasn't with them when they did the robbery. Well, what did he do? Well, I'm going to get to that. Oh. Okay, David Updike had been born in New York in 1830. When he was 25 years old, he went to California, where, too late for the gold rush, he took employment with a California stage company for two years. Then in 1864, he came up into Idaho. He discovered, actually, a rich claim, and with his profits from that venture, he bought a livery stable in Boise. I see. And this became the headquarters for a large gang of road agents and horse thieves. And Updike, for his share of the plunder, had supplied the robbers with horses, guns and ammunition for their assault upon the stagecoach at Portland. So he was kind of the money behind the venture, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. So anyway, long story short, most of the treasure was never accounted for. All that money. But so. You know, the guy that's the front man like this Updike and furnishing the money and the horses and everything to go from Boise clear across to eastern Idaho, he took kind of a risk too that he'd ever get his percentage back. Yeah, that's you know that's a good question. I don't know how he got his share of the money. Yeah, but I I'm sure he did somehow or another. Yeah. So anyway, Updike was involved in politics in Idaho and managed to get himself elected sheriff of Ada County. Here we go, another we crooked go. politician <laughs> and sheriff. So anyway, he planned to use his position to dispose of this strong vigilante committee. Well, because it was cutting into his business, his illegal business. Yeah. Well, he managed to get warned issued for the arrest of 30 men but planned to shoot down the leaders and as many others as possible claiming they had attempted to resist or escape sure well the committee received notice of the plans they armed themselves and met the posse of 15 of course at that point they were outnumbering them two to one so the entire party proceeded to Boise where the complaint was dropped well, next, the county commissioners brought charges against Updike for defaulting on a loan. Uh, in 1865, the citizens had organized an expedition against uh, marauding Indians, and Updike managed to be involved, and he embezzled most of the arms and supplies uh, and uh, put, gave them to his gang. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the principal witnesses against Updike was a guy named Reuben Raymond, and he was a recently discharged soldier, much, like, much liked in the neighborhood, and a guy named John C. Clark, uh, in a job put up by Updike, murdered Raymond in a stable, but there were witnesses, and two days later, Clark was taken from the guardhouse and hung. So there's a lot of hanging going on I'm going to say, you're wasting a lot of rope here. <laughs> That's true. Well, they may have used the same rope over again. I, I don't know. Okay. Well, the citizens were outraged. They established a night watch and targeted the criminal element with uh, death or banishment, and many got the word, and soon Updike was nearly alone, but under the watch of lie of the vigilantes. So Updike left town for a place called Rocky Bar. Okay. The vigilantes followed closely. They arrested Updike, and they took him here to a go. place... You're ahead of me, Zeb. <laughs> the place called Syrup Creek, which was a little about 10 miles from Rocky Bar. There they selected a tree, and you yep. saw this coming, with sturdy limbs. They hanged the prisoner, and the remainder of the Updike gang learned of the fate of their leader, and soon there was not one of Updike's gang to be found anywhere near Boise. So, although Updike was not hanged for his part in the Portland of Stage robbery, he still met his fate that was due. Now, one quick note. I know we're about out of time. Yeah, I got about two minutes. Okay. The gold bars, yeah. the 15 gold bars, were never sold or found. And the speculation is that the gold was buried somewhere near the site of the robbery. Uh -huh. So the gold valued at 86000 at that time would now be worth $1.6 at least. Or one more. go. Do you have a metal detector? Do I? No, but I'll buy one. Okay. <laughs> so the robbery site was in the canyons around the Portneuf River a few miles south of Pocatello. Oh, my goodness. It's still there. As far as we know. But, you know, as we've talked before about buried treasure, sometimes people will find treasure yeah. and they don't tell anybody. You know who we might find is even the rope. <laughs> <laughs> I just hope it's not still attached to who they used it last on. <laughs> and that happened literally on both sides of the state then. Boise area and Port Neuf and over of course down into Denver, down yeah. into Colorado. Holy smokes. There were some bad people back then. You know, but the vigilantes had a way of discouraging that activity. Yeah. 
I mean, uh, there was a lot of rope. I mean, the guy that must have led the horse with all the rope. Yes, and uh, keep in mind, sometimes the vigilantes may have hung the wrong guy. Oh, you think so? That could have happened. Mistakes were made. Could have happened. You know, that would be a really long, maybe a short ride to the nearest tree, I mean, for those guys, knowing that that was it. That was the end. Yeah, and uh, no mercy. No mercy. So. Wow. That's pretty devastating. Good story. Well, I enjoyed that. I like that because it's close by here, and yeah. we can relate to Idaho and Boise and yeah. Pocatello. And I like this idea of you coming out here and being in the studio. That's kind of nice because it we is. can uh, go back and forth a little better. Yeah, it's a lot easier, and uh, let's do this again. We'll do that. We'll Dr. Have to work Isha, real quick, I only got a minute, and then I got to do a commercial break before the real hard break at the bottom of the hour. Dr-History.com, uh, growing and getting bigger all the time. You know, Zeb, we still do not have a listener in Wyoming. What? What's going on? We've got all the western states, nobody in Wyoming. Now all the foreign countries. Five, 55 countries, nobody in Wyoming. What's the matter with Wyoming? You know, there's a lot of good people out there, a lot of good cowboys. Somebody surely has a friend in Wyoming. Well, for... <laughs> they can tell. Sick. Go to our web page. Here we are at what university over in China? Peking, Peking University in and Beijing. And we can't get somebody in Wyoming? What's going on? Three, hour, three hours away. Holy And by the way, Zeb, I am planning on going to China next spring to meet some of these students. Are you really? I, uh, that's the plan right now. Okay, we have a quick call. Stand by. Call her real fast. I've only got 30 seconds. Make it quick. Yeah, Wyoming, you still use the smoke signal, so that's why there's no time. Okay, well, we'll build a fire. Thanks, Al. God bless you. <laughs> Dr. History, thank you so much. You bet. You have a good day. Excellent, Jeff. excellent program. Dr. Ken Turner, better known as Dr. History, right here on Zeb at the Ranch. Hey, don't forget Ganol Landscaping and Sprinkler Service, 336 South, 450 West of Paul. And uh, if you've got any trees that the limbs are kind of hanging out of control and swaying back and forth, hey, don't forget prune those trees, fruit trees, ornamental trees, shade trees, everything. Dr. History's leaving, and I'll tell you what, you folks give Scott Gano a call at 438-2485 or his cell phone, 431-8733. 24-hour storm damage available. They'll be there if you got tree problems. They are the best, and they can get those big old stumps out of the ground, too. Call the number, 431-8733. My buddy Scott Gano and the rest of the crew serving you. Right now, we're going to send it back over over to our main studios. We'll be back in just a moment. And now, back to Zeb at the Ranch on AM 1230 KBAR. To reach Zeb, call 436-2244 or toll free 1-866-927-4587. And now, here is Zeb. Bell. Oh, thank you very much. And I uh, want to say also thank you to our dear friends at A Child's World at 1308 Overland in Burley. All kinds of clothing, warm coats, all the goodies for the kids and the whole family right there at A Child's World and all the books and the toys and the games and the puzzles. If you're doing your early Christmas shopping, this is the place to go. And they've got layaway. And I'll tell you what, the folks are really, really nice. At A Child's World, 1308 Overland and Burley, you stop in and see them today. And also, if you've got a surgery coming up or maybe a life-saving colonoscopy, don't forget to contact the Ambulatory Surgery Center. Yes, save money. Give them a call at 1344 Highland Avenue in Burley. The number six seven seven eight 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 eight. Ambulatory Surgery Center, along with A Child's World, bringing you school days in Cache County every Thursday at about 10 minutes after 10. And we thank both of them for their sponsorship. Thank you. Right now, let's go to the phone lines. And we have with us uh, Mr. Noah Rothman. Good morning, Noah. How are you today? Good morning. I'm doing quite well. Thanks for having me. Well, uh, I want to ask you, where about am I calling to this morning? My lovely engineer called you 908. What's that prefix? What area? Uh, that is actually western New Jersey, but I'm located in uh, Jersey City, right across the river from Manhattan. Western New Jersey. I love New Jersey, but you've got one thing that you've got too much of back there. Too many trees. How in the world did they ever fight the Revolutionary War back there and hit anybody with all those trees? 
Well, we do enjoy our trees. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of them have been cut down from the Revolutionary War period. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, got to say that uh, we're quite fond of our trees, so we wouldn't be giving them up even if for, uh, for better aim. Well, let me... At the Red Coast, as it were. Let me ask you this, Noah. You wrote a very interesting piece that I highlighted uh, many, many times over in regards to a generation of Democrats lost in the Obama era. And when I read this, I thought, hmm, maybe there's hope for the future after all. Give us a little explanation of what you mean a generation of Democrats lost. Well, a lot of the focus has been uh, from the national press, understandably, on national election results on the federal level. And on the federal level, uh, Democrats did not do especially well uh, in either the 2010 and 2014 midterms. And today, as a result of those two sweeping Republican victories and a very marginal Democratic hold in 2012, uh, Democrats now face the prospect of having a, uh, a very lopsided Senate, a 54-seat majority most likely, in the Republicans, but the House majority is most significant. It's about two, probably around 250 seats, uh, which isn't something that you can erase in one cycle. Democrats will have to spend some time uh, going after the Republican majority in order to re retain their own majority. But the more interesting electoral defeats that Democrats have suffered have been on the legislative level, farther down the ballot in states. And when Barack Obama took office, he had the benefit of two wave elections, uh, 2006 and 2008, that favored Democrats. Mm -hmm. uh, Democrats controlled about 62 of the nation's 99 legislative chambers when the president took office in 2009. Today, that's entirely reversed. Republicans control 69, or will control in January, 69 of the nation's 99 legislative chambers. Uh, the Republicans control 23 states entirely, top to bottom, governor's mansions and the legislatures, and compared to Democrats, seven. And uh, they will control 29 Secretary of State's offices, which is incredibly important if you have a contested election. Right. Uh, 32 lieutenant governors and 31 governors, probably more when all the votes are counted. So a whole generation of Democrats has been virtually wiped out. That's the farm team. And they don't have a farm team anymore. Well, okay, great. I hope they turn their uniforms in. But my next question is... Okay, Noah, how? How can uh, there be such uh, outgoing support for Hillary to be president in 2016, and why is she the media darling? When you lay out these numbers and you show that there's been a reduction in uh, some of the Democratic faithful, my goodness, where does she get all of her power? Well, she's a very formidable candidate, mostly because she doesn't have a whole lot of uh, competition uh, on the Democratic side. Even a sitting vice president is uh, no match for Hillary Clinton with, if you do a head-to-head -head matchups on the Democratic side. And if there is a competitive primary, there will be a primary, but right now it doesn't look especially competitive. Yeah. She just doesn't face a whole lot of competition. Um, is she a formidable political player? Yeah, absolutely. Is she inevitable? Uh, it, it's looking increasingly unlikely that that is the case. There's going to be a contested election in 2016, and she's going to have to campaign as hard as anybody else would. Yeah. This doesn't have any, any significant rivals. And based on the election results in 2010 and 2014, the, the Democratic bench is going to be much thinner. Uh, if she does not win in 2016, uh, the, the Democrats are going to have a hard time finding a new candidate who has that much gravitas with a statewide election or a federal election, not necessarily a first-time House candidate. If she does win, Democrats won't have, well, most likely, if she wins one term, she'll probably win two terms, and most likely, Democrats won't be able to elect somebody else to the national level to, to have more faces compete on the national level until 2024. Uh, that's quite a long time to be developing a bunch of candidates. Absolutely. No, let me ask you this, and, and I've said this for the last couple of days on my program. I honestly believe that the Republicans, uh, they better walk on thin ice and be real careful for a while because the general public didn't vote for them because they loved Republicans. They voted against the Democrat ideology of Barack Obama. It wasn't that they fell in love with the Republican ideals. Do you agree or not? Oh yeah, I think that's smart. And um, there have been some 
notions on the conservative side that it's time for brinkmanship, um, particularly about the president's planned executive orders around uh, anatizing uh, some uh, illegal immigrants, uh, perhaps threatening shutdowns uh, again or going after impeachment threats. That kind of thing sounds very short-sighted to me. I think that it would be inviting, as you suggest, uh, more problems than it than it uh, than it would solve. How do you keep though, if you were in charge? How do you keep the Republicans from shooting themselves in the foot? They have a penchant for doing something stupid, and right now they've been handed a golden opportunity. They've been handed a golden opportunity to turn this country around and be conservative and have great values, bring back a morality system. How in the world are they going to do that with all the infighting that still exists within the party? Well, I think a lot of smart lessons were learned um, after the, the government shut down in October of last year. The, the Republican brand still has not recovered from that episode. A lot of uh, a lot of careers were advanced by that, but more were uh, were hampered. And I think that the small cabal that was able to uh, force Republicans to engage in that strategy, a very ill-fated strategy, has withered, all, partially because it was such a failed strategy, and also because the Republican uh, uh, conference in both the Senate and the House is so much larger that a small group of individuals can no longer really force Republicans into a strategy that is uh, doomed to, to failure, as was the shutdown. We have an example of that. In August of this year, during the, the border crisis, um, the Republicans spent a lot of time calling that an absolute crisis that needed to be addressed immediately, and then the House couldn't vote, couldn't pass a vote to address that crisis. Uh, it was a it was a Democrat or it was a Republican submitted piece of legislation, but it, it met with such opposition in the Senate and a uh, small group of conservative legislators in the House, legislators in the House that they couldn't pass it. Now, rather than abandon ship and go away for the August recess. The Republican conference uh, stayed in session for one more day and passed another bit of legislation, rescuing victory from the jaws of defeat. Uh, that's the kind of thing that I think you're going to see more, uh, a little bit more smart, forward-thinking strategy rather than um, short-term appeasing of, uh, of base conservatives who would like to see very strong measures pressed, and strong measures are required, but in a smart fashion. Uh, so I think you'll see a little bit more of that, less brinkmanship. All right, now let me ask you this question. You're a man uh, that knows and you're very articulate in displaying your opinion. We have had just absolute horror stories about Harry Reid and his uh, absolute power and his hiding of bills and uh, putting them in the drawer and never to be seen again. Are we really going to do any better with Mitch McConnell? We've already seen him in this position once. I'm not so sure I want to see him in the position twice. Yeah, so uh, there's, there's an argument for both sides of that. Frankly, I think he's been a, uh, an effective manager, a smart manager in that position. He's not a figure who uh, has his eye on higher office. This is the highest office he's going to attain in his career. I think he knows it. Um, his goal is to guide the party in a sensible direction in order to achieve, maintain these majorities in 2016 and possibly attain the White House. And I think that's, that's his responsible goal. Uh, but I understand conservatives frustrations with a Republican Party that seems perennially focused on the next election. There's yeah. always a next election. And if, if that's always going to be the focus, you're never going to achieve great things. And most likely, the next election isn't necessarily going to be the only election that you'll have to worry about. So I, I feel that pain. I understand it. But it's also the majority leader's job to be a, a responsible steward of the party and not necessarily be a grand reformer. And grand reforms uh, come from a, a cooperative White House, which is not something Republicans have right now. Absolutely. They're, not, they're not going to get it. Uh, the, uh, Barack Obama has signaled his intention to uh, just engage in conflict with the Republican majority from here to, to January 20th, 2017. So I just don't see how you're going to have any sweeping grand reforms, even if you had a, somebody who was willing to engage in that process in, in Mitch McConnell. So while I understand the concerns, it's kind of hard to say that things would be any different if you had a, uh, a more confrontational majority leader. All right, we have a caller with a question. Quickly, caller, I'm almost out of time. Go ahead, please. Hey, good morning, Jeff and guest. Horace Leonard, I mean, this, this woman just makes me reek. 
why don't they do something, either put her back to work or fire her? Is there anything this uh, wave can do to help us? You know, it's a, it's a good question. Noah, what about Lois Lerner? She's still on the payroll and absolutely uh, criminal charges. Bring us up to speed as to what you think should happen with that case. Yeah, I've heard some uh, rumblings about having uh, hearings, not just on the House level, but on the uh, on the Senate level, and in in the new Congress. And I think that's appropriate. I'm not exactly sure what they can do. I think probably the most not satisfying outcome, but most productive outcome, would be, and the House should have done this a while ago, would be to extend her immunity from prosecution, mm -hmm. so that she can get to the bottom of whether or not this the IRS scandal was in fact ordered from a higher source. Right now, she's she's essentially the scapegoat, and she has not taken any responsibility for it in the form of having having to endure a punishment of any kind. Uh, and I, I think that would be appropriate. But if you were to prosecute Lois Lerner on a criminal level, then that would be where the scandal ends. Uh, so I'm not sure if that's the, the most the smartest political outcome. But uh, but I've definitely heard that the next re Republican Congress is perfectly interested in not letting the IRS scandal. Just sit. They're going to address it. All right. One final thought here this morning, Noah, and you're closer to this than most. The Republicans have another issue that they have to try to overcome in their tenure of power that they just obtained in the last election, and that's the news media itself. The media has been against them and has shown their disdain for Republicans. How in the next two years are they going to get an even shot, if you will, in the media? Gosh, you know, I don't, I don't know that's ever going to happen. Frankly, it's there's a, a, a culture on the coast, and particularly in the Acela corridor, where I am currently located, uh, that is much more friendly towards Democratic narratives than it is towards Republican narratives. It's been that way for a generation, and I expect it'll be that way for a generation more. The good news is that Republicans can win even without the media on their side. Republicans maintained control of the White House over the course of the last decade. They're about to have the largest majorities they've had since Herbert Hoover was in the White House, uh, and all without the assistance of the media. So it's not as though that this is a permanent ob obstruction in the way of Republican majorities. Republicans can and have talked over the heads of the media in the past to the American people and won the argument. I expect that's uh, something that they should be focused on doing more in the future, and, uh, and there's glimmers of hope. I really appreciate you coming on. Associate Editor at Hot Air, Noah Rothman. Noah, thank you, and uh, I'll call and have you back in the future. I appreciate your opinion. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, sir. Have a good day. Very interesting young man right there, Noah Rothman, with a uh, group called Hot Air out of the East Coast, a uh, very political uh, area and uh, school of thought. Thank you very much. Holy smokes, it's time for the weather. And the weather, I'm almost a little bit late, to be honest with you, brought to you this hour by Scarrow's Meats. 331 North Road, Jerome, number to call, 324-7657. Everything they sell is guaranteed and they've got delicious smoked hams or smoked turkeys for thanksgiving oh my goodness you better call order yours today 324-7657 scarrow's meats they're selling taste one bite at a time here now michael rogers weather hello everyone michael rogers is up the ranch i'm gonna pull out your sweater might want to get your hoodie and stocking cap. My only kick in some gloves. It's going to be cold today. Um, you're going to get up to 35. That's it. 35. That's daytime high for the day. 15 for the Omanite low. Now, because the Magic Valley of South Central Idaho, each location has their own different microclimate. Some temperatures may not be the same for all locations that I'm asking on to you. I uh, look for snow on Thursday. Two inches on the ground is over, said, and done. Then it's going to change the rain on Friday. Enjoy the weather. So with you guys. Thank you, Michael. Brought to you by Scarrow's Meats. 331 North Road, Jerome. Don Scarrow and the crew. 324-7657. Selling taste one bite at a time. Gene, Gene, Gene. How are you doing this morning? Oh, I'm doing all right. Just busy. Did you hear our communication system in the house before when I was yelling, Goober! Did it leak through the microphone? Oh, yeah. I heard it loud and clear. Oh, you did? Yes. Are you, you telling me that? Huh? 
you had your mic on. Well, you know, it's our communication, we got a big house. And if Goober's over on one side of the house and I'm hearing somebody over here on this side of the house, uh, we haven't developed a buzzer system yet. So I just sit back and turn the mic off, I thought, and go, Goober! <laughs> yeah, well, the mic wasn't off, so it went, it went over. Oh, well, I heard you respond and I thought, you're not Goober. No, all I just all I heard to say is somebody there, and I'm like, um, no. Oh, okay. Anyhow, uh, it was Dr. Ken Turner, Doctor History, coming in, and we had Ruby ready to attack him, and she has a one inch vertical, so I was afraid she might bite his ankles. <laughs> <laughs> As is always the way. Hey, Snyder Surplus isn't just an army and hunting supplies. No, they've got something for everybody. They've got office chairs, and they've got all the desks. And they got, oh my, my goodness, the list just goes on and on. They've got couches and filing cabinets, and they've got even got tea tables. Tea tables. Yes, they do. And uh, they got new items coming in every day. And you want to check out all the bunk beds and the uh, memory foam mattresses. They got it all for you right there at Snyder Surplus at 112 South 200 West of Rupert. They've got a brand new store, brand new merchandise, and same friendly, great service at Snyder Surplus. Plus, you stop in and see them today. Oh, my goodness. Um, give me a call. 436-224-1866-927-4587. Veterans Day 2014. And as I said, there's so many activities going on all through the day. There was a list in the paper, as a matter of fact, of all the different Veterans Day events. And I really was impressed. I mean, like, I think I counted, like, uh, pretty close to 20, 25 different events going on in this area. God bless all the people that are involved in uh, a nice, respective event for Veterans Day. Uh, give me a call, 436 224 While I'm waiting for your call that I know is coming in, you just heard the weather forecast with Michael Rogers, and I swear I heard him say possibly on Thursday two inches of snow on the ground. Then you had better prepare. You'd better be ready for winter driving with your uh, studded snow tires and everything else to get you through the slush, the ice, and the mess and everything from our friends at your Magic Valley. Valley Les Schwab Tire Centers, all seven locations. All the pin for studs tires, the tire chains, the traction tires. I mean, my goodness sakes, they've got it all for you. And if it's going to get cold like it's supposed to tonight and tomorrow night, my goodness, you better have your battery checked. And if you need a new battery, they've got the best in batteries at your Magic Valley Les Schwab Tire Centers. With Lane and Rupert, Dave on Blue Lakes and Twin, Mike and Buell, Mike and Jerome, the Twist family and Paul, John on Poline and Twin Falls and Randy on Overland and Burley, your Magic Valley Les Schwab Tire Centers. Good morning, caller. You're on the air. Good morning again. Yes, sir. You know, you know that this is the first time in my history of listening to you that I've listened to you for the entire three hours. Oh, my. And I have quite enjoyed it, especially Doctor's History. Oh, he is a wonderful gentleman, and I give Ken a lot of raspberries, and I kid him and everything, but oh my goodness, he is a extremely talented young man. I say young man because he's younger than I am. Yes, he is, but I'll tell you one thing about that. It's your little injections into the program that make it what it is. Oh, well, thank you. You're very kind. Uh, yeah. He makes he makes history very interesting, and quite frankly, I wish I'd have had him for a history teacher in high school than, than the gentleman that I did have standing at the podium. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's, there's supposed to be a robbery or something that happened up there uh, between Alamo and the California Trail. Yes, yes. And nobody has ever found it that's, that's least admitted to it. You know... And- I studied that a little bit, Keith, and and that was a very interesting circumstance. And, and Doctor History had that on the program one day, and supposedly the wealth of that robbery is still up there. Yeah, and I know people who have went to try to find it in without avail. 
Well, I appreciate your call and your remarks. I got time for one other call that's waiting in the wings. God bless you on this uh, Veterans Day. Thank you again for your service to this country, and we'll talk to you tomorrow probably. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Very nice man. Caller, good morning. You're on the air. Last call. Good morning, Zell. I missed you this morning when you called me on the phone. Well, Dave Z, how you doing, old buddy? Well, I got to explain to you that you think the Green Bay Packers won the other night, but they lost by one point. How in the world could you perceive that, my friend, when they won 55 to 14? What? It's Obamanomics. Didn't you listen to him last Wednesday, or after the election, how he explained how the Democrats won? Oh, yeah. Okay, now write this down. It's complicated. Okay, I've got a pen. The Packers lost 55-56. Chicago Bears only played a quarter of their, to their potential. Uh-huh. So a quarter of their potential scored 14 points. So if you take the other three quarters... If they each quarter scored 14 points, add that up. It's 56, 55, Chicago won. It's it, just that us conservatives aren't smart enough to see that, that we actually lost the election and you lost this bet on this ball game. You know, Dave, the problem with you is that you have been looking at the south end of cattle going north for too long. But do you see what I mean? Oh, I do. As a matter of fact, it's a philosophy that I will treasure for the rest of my life, at least till tomorrow night when we go to dinner. God bless you, my friend. I just had to tell you this. <laughs> Have a good day, buddy. Thanks. I got to run. Okay, yeah. thanks. Oh, my goodness. I got to work on that philosophy for a while. Uh, tomorrow morning, we'll be back here at 806. Stay warm. In all seriousness, we were going to have a little bit of a song for Veterans Day. Toby Keith, I'm going to turn it back over to Gina. She's been so patient with me. I'm running late. God bless all of our veterans on this Veterans Day 2014.